Hey, hey. What's up, man? How you doing? Good, good. What's happening, man? It's awesome to see you. Let me get our Greg pulled up here. You you are... Uh... Hey, Greg. There you are. Hey, guys. How's it going? Doing good. How is everybody? Pretty good. I, hey, Greg, I, tell, me, tell me how this sounds. Sound okay? Yeah, you sound good. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to... Really, this is my... Well, I've, I've done a couple of live chats in the past, but... Uh, I, I just thought I'd try it again and, and tell you a little story here. These two guys in here with, that are on here with me now have helped me tremendously over the last couple of weeks. Um, when I did the lives back in the spring, I've actually deleted those. They, I just couldn't get things to work right. I was doing it on my phone and uh, just couldn't figure it out. So a buddy of mine, Brian Carlton, uh, who had Backyard Bees, North Carolina, he uh, he told me about this Castle Hives guy right here, Brian, in front of me and a while back. And uh, watch out! I didn't really know who he was, and I just kind of backed off the lives. I was so busy, but I reached out to Brian um, recently, and, and he helped me kind of figure some things out. Many of you may know. Many of you probably joined the chat last week that we had with some heavy hitters. We had, you know, three of us were kind of at least I was down at the bottom of this thing, but we had. Uh, Ian Stelper from Canadian, Be Canadian Beekeepers Law, uh, blog. We had uh, Cayman Reynolds on there. We also had Jose from the California Beekeeper from his YouTube uh, channel. We also had Chad on here. Uh, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I think, uh, Brian, you got a lot of views on that thing, don't you? Even since we turned Stop the Live. How many you got views you got on that thing now? It's over a thousand now. That's amazing. Yeah, and, nice. Um, it was awesome, but those were some heavy hitters, and so yeah. I was excited about it. And so then Brian told me I needed to do one. That was on his channel. <laughs> and so here I am. I'm, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone. I'm kind of trying to manage a lot of the technology here, and, and I'm kind of set up the way Brian and Greg have recommended here a little bit. And so hopefully it's going to be okay. But I thought, first of all, for those who may not know, uh, Brian and Greg, I'd like you guys to kind of introduce yourselves, tell me about your channel, Initially, kind of the name of your channel. It's on the obviously it's on the um, screen here, but just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll start with you, Brian. Well, thank you there, Bruce. Um, my channel, I mean, like the name says, it's Castle Hives. Um, I, I started, oh my gosh, let me see, five years ago. Um, and and the name of the channel it came from uh, Castle is is my mom's maiden name, and the beehives were on her property. So I just got thinking, I, you know, you got to come up with some kind of name. So that's where the Castle Hives name started. But, you know, I'm the backyard beekeeper. I show, um, and there's Brian Carlton, I see. Uh, but I should, you know, everything on my channel, I show everything for everyone to see, you know, like last winter, I lost, I lost all my hives and I showed it. So I just want to show everything that way those that are interested in beekeeping, they don't, you know, they're not just seeing me going over to a flow hive and turning a valve and getting that golden liquid out. You know, I want to show everything that we, everyone, you know, sees more or less my entire journey into beekeeping. So, you know, and through that time, I've met a lot of great people. This, this one down here that I'm still, I, I went and I worked, I was working for donuts and I did not get paid a donut. So I got I got to talk to him about that. But, you know, that's that's my channel. I mean, I just I I, I enjoy the beekeeping. I love the beekeeping. Um, I'm located in northeast Ohio. So those that don't, um, you know, follow me, you know, I'm, I'm in northeast Ohio. So we get you know, we get the cold winters. You know, I'm, I'm not like Bruce where, you know, we get. uh you know, I'll get a text message saying, hey, guys, it's 72 degrees. And I'm like, well, that's nice. It's 34 here. So, you know, for those that are in, in like the upper um, areas of the states, you know, the Midwest, you know, um, you can see what I do. So but I, I tell everybody, though, too, you know, I, I'm no expert in it. I'm I'm like a an experienced rookie is about all I am. So. You know, I, I lean on to folks like, like, let me see here, like this one over here and, and this one over here and Bruce, you're, you're flipping me all around. But yeah, you know, I lean on, on a lot of the people 
that I've met, luckily, through YouTube. You know, if I run into any issues um, to, you know, just help me and guide me along. And, and I also share that, too, like I said. So, but, you know, that's in a nutshell, you know, that's, that's what Castle Hives is. So just a backyard beekeeper trying to make my way through this beekeeping hobby. Great. Well, I do kind of try to rub it in a little bit because we've had some beautiful weather. Um, but that also shows, you know, it also can create some problems. The bees get super active. They can blow through their stores really quick and it can become a problem, actually. So it is great. And it's, the weather is beautiful. The bees are happy. But I think we're going to have some freezing, if not close to freezing weather next week. And so, you know, the stores they have in there will be good for them, obviously. Um, yeah. Greg, tell us your story. What you got for us? Yeah. Well, uh, Bruce, thanks for uh, for the invite and for uh, Brian. Brian's a wizard when it comes to these uh, StreamYard live things. He's really got that nailed down and looks good and sounds good. And I, I like the, um, the the format here because you can see the comments, you can see the people, and uh, that's pretty cool. So thanks for um, thanks for the invite. I guess the, the real quick uh, intro to who we are. A lot of folks um, probably don't know who we are, but um, the long story short. Uh, quite a few years ago, uh, I got in a real bad car accident and kind of uh, life completely changed. And we decided to uh, pack up and kind of get our kids and our life um, out of the cookie cutter subdivision and get it back out to the land and kind of get back to what was simple, what was important. And uh, my wife and I raised uh, seven kids. We homeschool. We're kind of uh, modern day back to the landers. And uh, we started just kind of sharing our journey um, on the farm. Um, a, a few years back, uh, that was kind of more like pigs, you know, pigs and uh, chickens and cows and gardening and, and those kind of things. And the whole YouTube scene has kind of changed where a lot of folks are still can get by with some of that content. But we kind of um, we're finding uh, so some difficulty sharing the real nitty gritty side of uh, taking our food in our own hands and things like that. Well, bees kind of fit into the, the picture there. And we started sharing our journey with beekeeping and um, you know, I think Brian probably knows uh, what I'm going to say next because I probably say it um, all the time. But we, um, when we do share our beekeeping and journey, it, it we're we are not experts. We have, you know, I'm going to claim to know what we're doing. We just see some results that uh, kind of um, repeat themselves year after year. Context is key, um, and so we just are sharing our journey with with beekeeping um, on our YouTube channel. We also have a podcast. Um, at the Contrary Beekeeper Show, which is all beekeeping related, our old, old podcast where some folks might know us from, it's called the Contrary Farmstead. Um, so we're, we've kind of been involved with uh, YouTube channels and podcasts um, over over the, the last few years, since about 2015 or so. And um, now we've kind of just migrated. There's a lot of fantastic beekeeping videos. Bruce, Brian, uh, of course, uh, uh, Bob and Ian and Cayman and everybody else that are putting out great content. Um, and so you can kind of get a huge diversity of northern beekeepers, southern beekeepers. Uh, I got Jose from the California beekeeper all the way out west. Everyone does things a little bit different. And I think that's pretty, pretty fun to watch. And uh, I think more recently over, over the last year or so, I, I think kind of what's been on our heart with our uh, YouTube channel is to kind of um, this is awesome. And don't get me wrong, you know, being able to, to meet and connect like this is great. Um, but I think there's also something to be said for the old fashioned sitting around uh, the the, the, the dining room table, having a cup of coffee, looking somebody in the eye, having that intimate conversation about not just the mind of the beekeeper, but the heart um, of the beekeeper. So we've had a lot of fun traveling across the country, sitting down face to face, uh, interviewing a beekeepers. And I think what's interesting is it's not it doesn't matter if it's a beekeeper with 3000 hives like we have or a beekeeper with two hives. Um, there's there's a lot of common threads that kind of weave us all together in life and in beekeeping. And we're really enjoying just kind of exploring that um, and, and capturing that content um, for our YouTube channel. And I think the greatest thing about that is meeting folks like Bruce and Brian and building, going from uh, this online community to taking advantage of opportunities where we can actually meet in person um, and kind of develop those relationships. And the good thing about it is every now and again, you get guys that will come down and help you work and put up a building and slap up some siding and, and get your uh, next uh, farm 2.0 ready so brian thanks for uh for coming out and helping yesterday we got a lot done didn't we yeah it was it was fun i mean even though i mean we were hanging metal but it was fun i mean we 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 got to talk all day long about bees 
it's hard to, so, hard to go wrong. And, you know, I, I did. Brian says he works for donuts. Now, I, I, the, our donut shop has such good donuts. They sell out by seven. If you're not there by seven, you get no donuts. So we were a little late um, getting mm-hmm. donuts. But So Brian, Brian, this is the kind of guy Brian is. Brian comes down, you know, two hours and 20 minutes, drives all the way down to Zanesville, Ohio, to help us do some farm work. And uh, what does he do? He brings and he brings gifts. Look at this thing. I don't know if you guys can see that. Oh, oh there we go. Look at that. That's a nice looking. Who made these, Brian? That would be Matt and Sarah. Well, and and I don't mind it downstairs. Look at that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Matt, um, Matt does a great job. Matt with Matt and Sarah. They do a great job. They so. do. They do. And, and Matt and Sarah, you know, I know, Matt, you're watching. I, I turned Greg onto, you know, your site. So, you know, I, I know um, if he needs anything, he knows who to go to. So, yeah, great work on those. Awesome. Bruce, for um, for folks that are kind of, uh, this is kind of like a little cross collab thing for folks that may not know uh, your story and, and what you do on your channel. Uh, what's What's your channel and what's your beekeeping adventure all about? Well, I was, I, um, well, first of all, I don't think I introduced you, Greg, how I got to know you. Now I'm going to my story. Um, what probably about three or four weeks ago, Greg is going to set up, you're going to be set up at the Hive Live conference, right, Greg? And right. he just reached out to me. Um, can't remember if it was on Messenger or how it was, but he reached out to me and he was like, I'm, we're probably going to sit down and do a little chat while we're at the Hive Live conference. And so I said, sure, that'd be great. And I kind of, you guys, I've just, I really haven't, looked at your channels I, i've heard of you but i just haven't there's so as you everybody on here knows there are a lot of channels on youtube not just mm-hmm. about beekeeping but every niche that you can uh, think of and so um i that's how i kind of met greg started watching a little bit of his stuff and i gotta tell you greg i watched a video um that really i actually texted him after i watched it it was about tim down in tennessee what's tim's last name i can't remember tennessee tim mccandless down in Kolyoka, tennessee that was one of the most awesome videos I've seen and uh, it was really good and I was just really impressed with that and, and then I also watched the one you did with the premiere with Jeff from premiere yeah. and uh, you know I'm, I'm mm-hmm. kind of going down the rabbit hole a little bit I obviously can't watch them all at once in one sitting but but that was really um, great and so but my story is I from the time I was very young I grew up on a farm and I was intrigued with insects and uh, things like that when I was in the first grade I actually had an insect collection i had like 100 bugs on that i learned how to pin the insects you know how to put them on you know display them and everything we had a a person here in our church local church i think it was that was an entomologist and he told me how to do that so that kind of went by the wayside for a few years and when i was in high school actually i think i was in ninth grade in biology uh we we actually used that same insect collection because i wasn't really into catching the bugs anymore but so I've been insects and, and nature have always been very important to me, very intriguing to me. And I just I love learning about it and uh, <clears throat> didn't really know a lot about bees, really not much at all. And uh, just fast forward to 2013, um, I I um there was a talk, a general, a general conference for our church. The, the, the speaker spoke on how. Uh, kind of comparing honeybees he talked about how his one of his relatives maybe his father had honeybees and how it was such a miracle and how all the bees work together you know each of them though they produce a, a teaspoon or a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in their lifetime they work together to, to perform great things together and so he kind of compared that to the church and how each of us kind of has our role you know we're not we're all different and um and so that kind of hit me. And then around that time, I was doing home health physical therapy. And I had a patient that I saw who had some beehives in the backyard. And I asked him about hmm. it. And uh, he just loved his bees. He told me about them. Um, some of the things he told me, I'm not sure were exactly how it works. But it, in his understanding, I was just intrigued by that. And my dad was really sick. He was basically uh, really sick with cancer. He passed away shortly after that, and I, I didn't want to really bother my mom about that when he was going through his uh, illness there. It was just a really difficult thing to go through for my mom, especially, but for our entire family, and especially for my dad. But but uh, shortly after he passed away, that was in January of 13, I asked my mom about putting just a couple of hives up on the farm up there. 
where I grew up and she, she thought about it. Um, and she asked a friend of hers, I think of around the Atlanta area or somewhere over in Georgia, maybe just north of here that had honey bees, what they thought about it and they really enjoyed it. And so she allowed me to get a couple of uh, hives. Now I, I went out, <clears throat> I decided to do it in April. I think it was April 27th when I actually got them, but it was a Monday or Tuesday night before that. And I got online. I didn't, you know, I started looking up honeybees I, and I got online. And I saw eight frame hives, 10 frame hives, even seven frame hives. I had no idea what a frame even was. Just no idea at all. Um, but I did know a guy who had bees and, and, uh, and somehow I made the connections with the guy who became my mentor. His name is David. I uh, lives not far from here who actually at the time was selling the, the equipment and the bees, everything you needed. And so I got up with him and that morning I went out to my buddy Nathan's house um, who had the bees, got in and he showed me what the queen looked like, what the worker bees looked like, what the drones looked like. You know, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, I looked, I thought the drone was the queen. You know how everybody does that because they're bigger. And I went straight from his place over to uh, David's place picked up two nukes actually he already had them in the 10 frame hives for me and uh set them i can't remember which i can't even remember what vehicle i used but i brought them home and if you watch my last video i just posted uh i guess monday or tuesday i think it was monday um you show the spot right where i put them right there at the farm and and uh carrying them across open them up let the bees fly of course i wanted to get in them but my but david told me don't you know let them sit there for a while so it about killed me I let him sit there for a week or two and then went in. And then I, every time I got in him, I had a question for him. And first year or two, I replaced the Queens. I don't know how many times thinking I, would, I was queenless. So I went and bought a queen or two from David and he sold them. He's like, you probably should just wait and see. And I'm like, no, I really don't. I can't find the queen. And so I probably bought, an, you know, eight or 10 Queens the first couple of years I didn't need to buy. Oh because the queens are probably taking care of themselves. He said, Bruce, you need to just, if you think you're queenless, just wait a couple of weeks and check again. And then if you don't see any eggs or any, you know, evidence of a queen, then you might need to get a new queen. But I was so eager. I think that happens to probably most of us. We're so yeah. eager, especially when we're new to uh, just jump right in and, and get it, you know, excited. Yeah. Don't really know what we really don't know what we're doing, but it's just, it's just an action for me. It's an absolutely exhilarating experience to get in a beehive. Even still, um, I was sending, uh, Matt, uh, Brian, and Greg, some videos yesterday of me getting in my bees here, and they were so fired up and angry. And I, the weather was weird. It was, it was, you couldn't decide if it wanted to be cloudy or sunny. And the bees were just nasty. We may have had some kind of front moving through because it did rain a little bit. That was actually Monday, I, I think it was. And, and, and uh, then it rained a little bit. So there was a front coming through. But <laughs> anyway. But I'm, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna post some videos that they can show you. I've, I've seen them. I kind of give them a little peek on how strong the bees are. I'm gonna. I just. I didn't have my actual camera with me, but I got a new iPhone here that's got a pretty good camera on it, and I tried it out. And it. I think I've got some pretty good footage. I may throw together a real kind of a rough, not finely edited video, just kind of a raw video mm -hmm. uh, of what I saw the day in some of those hives out there. But that's kind of my story. Since then, I have been absolutely obsessed. Why did I do YouTube? The truth is in 2014, I was in my backyard and I just caught a swarm, just living the dream. I had a table set up out there with a table saw and I was about to work on some bee boxes. And I had, I think it was my first or second board that I cut. Uh, I heard a pop and I looked down and I had three of my fingers were covered in blood. And so I, I basically, my sec, my index finger on my left hand uh, was pretty well destroyed. And, uh, but they put it back together. They fixed it up and, while I was recovering from that, my daughters had delved in YouTube a little bit with some horses, horse stuff that they had done. And so I asked one of my daughters, how do you even do a video? I'm going to show you in a second. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't have to do that because I've only got four fingers. I say, I'll see you guys at six. You know, and people look at me funny. But anyway, yeah. so, at least so they, did, yeah. but they, did, they did repair the finger initially. But at that time, I started kind of playing with YouTube a little bit. The Those original videos that I put out are really not good but some of them did quite well i guess there just weren't as many youtubers out there at the time doing beekeeping stuff back then it was jp the bee man and and he was probably the one to watch as much as anybody just a lot of people weren't doing it uh, i think yappy travis or yappy b b man was doing a little bit back then there were some different ones but um so and you know 
uh, the Pat B. Mal. I watched a lot of his stuff back then. I think Don actually might be on this this tonight. He checked in, so I think that's kind of cool. But so anyway, so I, I started just doing a few YouTube videos here or there. I did it for a few videos for a while. I got quite a few views, but had no clue about monetization. Had no clue how YouTube works. Didn't even know how to check and see really how many views I had. I'm not even sure if the YouTube Studio was as as obviously it wasn't as as advanced then. I just didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I got a little just tired of it, a little uh, discouraged about it and just kind of quit doing it. And then in 2018, the repair on my finger failed and they went ahead and took it down to here. And it's actually much better now. I can use it a lot better. It was always in the way before it always hurt. Now it, I really don't even notice it unless I start talking about it. Now I can feel my finger again. But <laughs> anyway, so that's where I decided around that time when I was kind of recovering from that. I'm like, I want to get serious and figure out how these people are doing these videos, figure out how to really edit, figure out how to get in and, you know, try to become monetized and just how to grow a channel. I also love sharing um, just what I'm doing. I'm kind of like probably both of you guys, like you mentioned, Brian, that you just show the good and the bad. And if you've watched mm -hmm. my channel for any length of time, uh, two things I'd like you to kind of realize. Number one, just kind of notice how I do try to show the good and the bad. I've actually showed some videos of bees that have died out. That was 100% my fault. You know, yeah, 100. I I did it. I screwed up, and uh, you know I, I'm not just going to show you the good stuff because bad things happen, and if if you're in bees long enough, you're going to lose some colonies. Whether it's your fault or not your fault, there's going to be some colonies to die out. And so, I try to show kind of it's almost it start off as a vlog, pretty much. That's what I'm doing. There are a few quote unquote kind of how to videos in there, kind of showing it, but it's more like how I do things, like Mike Berry says on his channel. It's not a how to, it's a how I do thing, and and I also want to try and just inspire people maybe to, to get into it. But I also want you to remember that um, it's, you know, it, it, it's tough and it's not just something for everyone. You know, you, you, it's not just a matter of throwing bees in a box and then just coming back and collecting the honey. That's kind of what I thought when I first got into it. I threw those bees, set them down there, had no idea, did no research, had no clue. And, uh, but, but because I had a tremendous mentor and I would say mentors via the local B club, uh, via David and Davis, who is more of a mentor probably for me now. And a lot of these guys, like you guys came in, Ian, just so many people that are supporting and helped me. Um, it's awesome that, that, um, it's just a great community. I probably would have given mm -hmm. up if, nobody would have, if I had no mentor and didn't know what I was seeing back then. You couldn't look on YouTube and find as much stuff. I wouldn't have had any yeah. idea. Do. I probably would have quit. So that's yeah. my story. And so here we are. Um, I do want to ask you two to send me a link or you can put in the comments after this is over so people can see it easily. Um, maybe a couple of your favorite videos that you've made or the ones that had the biggest impression on you, the people you've met as you've gone around down doing, about doing your channel. I've got a, I was just kind of plugging along just, you know, very few views here or there. And I did a video It's called dealing with the mean hive of honeybees back in right after I got started doing it for serious. And it really is not a great video. The quality is not very good. I didn't know what I was doing, but the bees really looking back on it, they weren't really all that horrible, um, but they were pretty aggressive and they had basically run the guy who owned the bees, a friend of mine, they'd run him out of the bee yard every time he went in there. So I agreed to help him out. And um, that, that video went semi-viral. And then I did one this spring about abandoned beehives that I found. And many of you have probably seen that. That has by far been my most popular video. I'm going to put links to those down below, as well as the most recent one I did, I think is possibly the most important one I've done. I hope you guys, if you haven't seen it, will jump on and watch that. But if you guys could send me a couple of links to some videos uh, that you really like from your channels, and we'll, we'll post those um, after after this live chat is over. Sure. Or two, just to help people, because I like you guys to go check out their channels. Uh, right. Greg and Brian have very different styles in their presentation, but they both have good information. I appreciate that. Yeah, Melanie, I see Melanie here. I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. So you guys got up here with me, but I'm going to try and Melanie's got a comment here. There it is. Um, there you says, go. I remember that video that you made when you lost that colony that starved and it was heartbreaking. <laughs> me and my husband were in tears. That was a couple of years ago, and it was. I had a, I think it was either three or four deep um, nukes that um, 
that had just starved. I, they were strong. I kept peeking in there and I'm like, man, there are tons of bees. They're fine. And I went out there one day in probably February, maybe. And they were just, just all laying it. You guys know what the star starvation looks like. And I learned a lot that day about starvation and I just mm-hmm. could not fed them and they died. And it was heartbreaking to me, but I was getting, looking forward to just taking those nuke boxes. I, I was sure there was a breed in each one of them, splitting it three or four ways and having four colonies. And then all of a sudden, it was the equivalent probably of two strong deeps worth of bees. They were just all dead. So probably four, possibly, you know, those will double in a year, probably eight or 10 colonies I lost because of my negligence. About yeah. All, that about all of us, I think though, at least we'll probably admit it. You know, there, we have a, a, a little separate isolated yard that we've um, it, it's a really long conversation, but the short, short version is we went down the treatment free route. I think like, like a lot of us have, because a lot of it sounds good and it feels good and, we want to believe idealistically that that's the way it's going to go. But, uh, man, we fought for years and years and years. And somehow every now and again, we'll get a couple hives that will uh, survive us and mostly our negligence. But uh, I hope I can get out and get a video of it. I've got one uh, yard here at the house. There's not many colonies. There's maybe 20, 24 colonies. And uh, they had low mite counts. And then uh, all of a sudden fall hit. They got blasted. And I think right now in that little yard, there's there's two survivors. Um, and so that's a whole other, you know, there's so many challenges, you know, as we kind of grow, whatever that is, the, the YouTube channel or uh, the scale of beekeeping or just grow from two hives to three to five. But uh, um, luckily, there's a lot of great uh, folks out there that you can learn from uh, and listen to. Uh, there's a lot of great mentors. I know um, on here on the chat, there's a lot of folks, Bruce, if we could just take a second and say, hey, um, old Don, the fat bee man's on here. We spent a lot of time with Don. Hey, Don. Uh, let's see who else do we know. Uh, Tony is it uh, MT Castle? I know I see Tony a lot on the, our local Ohio beekeepers yep. page. So Tony, hey, good good seeing you there. Of course, yeah, uh, Ian the Canadian uh, beekeeper. It'd be good to see. You. Hopefully, see you in person, Ian. Hopefully, uh, Canada doesn't uh, keep cracking down, and yeah, you, you can come down and um, see all those hillbillies down in Tennessee. That sure would be fun. Uh, Malcolm McKibben's on here. We met him at the last Hive Live conference. Erin uh, Romine, she's uh, local here to Ohio. Good to see you there, Aaron. Um, Brian, who else is on here? I see uh, there's Chad Mustang Ranch. He's on there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you guys probably know there. Or uh, I saw Rob Pollock uh, stopped in there a little while ago. Yeah. The Robbies. And th- you know what? I always said his his outfit wrong. And when we interviewed him, I even asked him, "How do you say this?" And he says, "Well, you know, uh, it doesn't matter." So I guess the the real way to say it is Larabies. How, how do you say how do you say lorabees.com, Bruce? I say Laura Lorabees.com or Laura Bees. Okay. I think it is kind of Lorabees, but I that I just can't with my southern accent, I have a hard time saying that. That's gonna be my excuse. Okay. So, that's, that's <laughs> me, forgive me, Rob. Forgive me, Rob. As you know, if you've watched my uh, videos this year, I one of my back in the spring, I really started working hard on trying to improve everything about the channel, the quality of the sound, the quality of the video and the products I'm using. And I had an old Jono's easy vape that I used and that thing kind of died. It didn't work out too well. I've got another one still, but I heard actually Stan Gore down in Texas, who is with uh, Texas friendly beekeepers group. Uh, he's, he's a character. He's kind of, um, in a way he's been a mentor from a distance. He, uh, he recommended, I think he's the one that told me, Hey, uh, you know, check out this. And I think Rob was just kind of getting this thing kicked off a little bit. And I bought one of those from him and, uh, tried it out, did a review on it. That's one of the first videos that, that kind of helped move me in the direction of the 10,000 subscribers, which, which was my immediate goal. Then I had about 7,000 or low 7,000 at the time. And that was right before I did the survivor bees video just so shortly before that. But, Rob has been extremely good to me. Now, I know there are a lot of quality products out there. Um, and so I'm not here to say, hey, it's the only one I actually have. He sent me a T-shirt to you, by the way. You can even see this. Oh, wow. Uh, it's nice. A, let me do it like this so y'all can see it. But I'm still trying. Y'all forgive me. I'm trying to figure out this technology here. So, but, well, I didn't you know, help. That didn't help. But anyway, Bruce, you know, that's made ugly, uglier, man. <laughs> Huh? Back here. I yeah, just made all the ugliness a little close there. <laughs> well, one thing that would help out as far as like the camera, I keep there's this A that you have on your no, head. No, no, no. 
Atlanta if Braves, isn't it? Them, yeah, the Atlanta Braves. If you take that and you th- – well, you could probably twist it and put it in your smoker. That <laughs> video would go viral. That's a pretty good smoker, isn't it? Smoker fuel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's grade A smoker fuel. Did you guys hear that joke about Alabama? No, what? What's well, a knock knock joke? It's, it goes something like, I asked Bruce, Bruce, uh, knock knock. He's there. Alabama. Alabama who? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hear you. I hear you. Well, we'll just see tomorrow night. <laughs> I'm nervous, y'all. I just, I mean, you know, I think they're going to win, but who knows? I mean, you just, that's why they suit it up and play the game, right? You think who, who's good? I don't know who we were talking about. <laughs> I'm about to make my light behind me red, too, if you're not careful. All I got to do is call <laughs> oh. thing. So, anyway. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> I have a good time with it. I thought about doing that and making a big deal about it, but I, I didn't. So, if you guys brought it up, you're the ones that made the deal about it. But I got to work. Yeah, well, it's not, the truth is, I'm a, I am went to BYU. I, was, I played a little football at BYU years ago. And, uh, and but I grew up here in Alabama fan. And so, I, I, BYU's been doing better. I, but I've just kind of, this has kind of become my trademark. So, I got to wear it. Yeah. But I, I, I tell people, I'm like, uh, when BYU doesn't do well, I've got a pretty good team to fall back on. So there you go. Bad. It's a pretty good team to fall back on, right? But I, I grew up a big Alabama fan. I pretty much I root for them. They're they're very near the top, and you know of my list. And you know that team up in the plains up in Auburn. Those guys. Eh, I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> There's probably some Auburn Tigers on here. That's okay. Everybody's got to have yeah. a fan. Here, you know what I mean? And then of course up there where you guys are at the. O H I O people, the Ohio State. That's why I don't like Ohio State because you always put the in front of it. That's kind of uppity. That's kind of uppity, don't you think? At at it's least you uppity. said it right. You know, you can't just say, you know, I'm going to go watch, you know, an Ohio State game. You know, you have to say, I'm going to watch the Ohio State. Yeah. You know. Okay, we got a good question here from Craig yeah. Chevron, and you guys, if I miss your questions, just Please don't. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm trying to follow this technology. And, and, and uh, Greg or Brian, if you catch something, just address it as well. But uh, Craig says, are you all running into the same problem we have here in southwest Virginia? Mm-hmm. Our bees are flying every day with no stores coming in. And he said, I'm afraid. I'm going to go on to that. I'm still trying to figure this out. He says, I'm afraid. They're going to get up all their stores. So I'm putting on fine with a backup of sugar until our winter sets in. Yep. Yeah, I, I can. That oh, is go ahead, a, Bruce. That is, I don't know. We're down here in the South as well. I don't know what you guys are doing up in Ohio, but, but yes, the bees, like it was the, today, I think when I left work at five o'clock, it was like 76 degrees outside. Mm-hmm. Now, Monday is supposed to be close to freezing. And so next week's going to be a little chilly. So they won't be flying as much. So the bees down here, it's like it just gets yanked back and forth. They never know what to expect. And so, my bees were extremely heavy this year. We had a phenomenal flow starting with the privet back in the spring uh, all the way. Then we had our, our Chinese tallow flow, which is our biggest flow around here. And then my bees went right. We put them on. They were, most of them around some cotton, which cotton is a phenomenal source. And we, then we had a great fall flow with the goldenrod and the aster. And I mean, it, every flow was the best flow I've seen of each thing. Normally you have one or two good ones and a couple of bad ones. But every year was phenomenal, and or every flow was phenomenal, and so my my bees were super heavy. Um, they still are pretty heavy right now. I could barely pick them up. I was moving some out to fill in some slots on my wow. hives. I couldn't hardly pick them up. They probably weigh well over 100 pounds, some of them. But I went through one yesterday. I had to replace some boxes out there on some of those that were really heavy, and in the bottom they're starting to clean out some space. I think for two reasons. Number one, they probably are starting to use up some of their stores. And number two, since it's been so warm, they're probably starting to lay down. They're going to start laying down there, which is good with they're the brood up because we want them to brood up right before they go to California. So, but I haven't had the issue having to put food on them yet. I did feed them a couple of times back in the fall because that's what I've always done, but I probably could have gotten by without it. So mm. what are you guys seeing up in Ohio? Good, Brian. I, so as far as temperature, like this, the weather is just, it's been killer. Now, as, as much as what I can appreciate not having to walk out and shovel the drive, for the beehives, it's killer because like temps, I'm looking at the next week and we have highs 
like tomorrow it's going to be 52, Saturday 53, and then 36, 31, 42. The bees, I actually went over to, I have one hive at a farmer's property, and I stopped by there today. I saw him out, so I swung by, and I figured I would just peek in the top. And, you know, I have that Vivaldi, and it has that screened area, so I can I can take my cover off and just take the burlap and look, and they are all over the sugar. Um, you know, and I, and I did see a couple flying, but it was more of the, they were taking little flights out and coming back. So they're, you know, they're hitting some cleansing flights. So that's good. But, you know, there, there is absolutely nothing out there. If we have days where it's 50, 60 degrees, there is absolutely nothing out there for them to go and forage on. So, and that makes it hard because here, you know, like, yeah, you're fine. You get them into the winter and, you know, December, January, February, but they're going to eat up those stores. And when we get into March, you know, when we start into that warming trend, there's absolutely nothing out there. And if we get these warm winters like this, if they're going through their stores faster, you know, that March, March is typically what I hear like in this area where it's just almost like that critical time because there's nothing out there. They've chewed up through their hive, you know, so that's led me. This would have been, this was the ending of my fifth season. You know, I, I have winter patties on all my hives. I have dry sugar on all of my hives. And I've got some of the hives that are not touching it. And then I have others where they have just stayed high. And I mean, they, I actually have had to refill, you know, add some sugar back into one of the hives because they are just chewing it up. So, you know, it just, it, I'll see in March, you know, I'll see when we get into March here this year, April, you know, if, if the work that I've put into them, you know, through the summer and the fall, I'll see if my prep um, has worked. But, you know, and one thing that I also did because our flow and, and I'm so jealous when you say about your gold, goldenrod flow is the best you ever had. Greg would probably say the same thing. Um, our flow up here was just non-existent. So that being said, you know, I was feeding earlier and I did not what little bit of honey that I saw. I didn't extract a single frame. I left everything. And even in my supers, I figured I'm going to leave it because if we have warm days and I need to swap out some frames just to give them a little bit, you know, I'm leaving that for them. So it'll be hard. This, winters like this are hard up here. So. It's not, not the same thing here in Zanes. I see uh, Aaron ask, uh, uh, Aaron's she's uh, here local to our uh, our beekeeping area and uh, she, I think she was asking if we were seeing yellow jackets this it's been uh, every year I feel like saying this has just been the goofiest craziest winter but I, it, I I think it every year it just keeps getting worse and worse it seems like our our um, our growing zone or our, our weather zone it seems like we keep going a hair further south incrementally every single year and that brings up more that brings that it pushes the cold and the snow a little further north and it brings the wet and the mild uh, moisture up. And it just seems to be an absolute train wreck here. You know, we had a, an amazing spring. We could do no wrong making queens, making nukes. Everything was awesome. We uh, got to about June, started um, probably started splitting too heavily in June um, and then mid June on it was complete dearth. We had hardly anything. Uh, we had a drought. Then we had nothing but rain. Those bees were struggling all the way back in June and July. Um, and luckily, if it wasn't for the bucket feeders, I, I would have probably lost an awful lot of colonies because of time management, getting in there and actually keeping everybody fed, staying on top of treatments. You know, we checked in June. We had our uh, our, our, the, our our Ohio State etnomologist came out, gave us a clean bill of health, loved what we were doing, uh, even got her a queen to take home. Uh, and, and, and try and uh, everything was awesome, but just, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm probably sidetracking Bruce, but I feel like every year as we try to grow, just grow and grow and grow, we get to a certain point and the wheels start to fall off and we're doing everything we can just to, just to stay in our lane, stay in our lane, stay in our lane. 
<clears throat> hoping that we get a break from the weather or a break from a fall flow. And it was just miserable all the way through. There was no fall flow here. It was absolutely terrible. Um, intense robbing. We're, you know, we're seeing um, competition from other pollinators that we just don't see around the hives on, on the sugar, on the feed. You know, bald face hornets, uh, every variety of ground wasp or hornet, um, all different types and sizes of bees. All, it was neat to all see, you know, 10 or 12 different species of pollinators at one place, but they were all robbing. You know, they're robbing the little areas where, you know, feed containers or totes or, or lines would be seep. They were everywhere. And that was just, it just kind of set things up. We did the best we could to try to get them going through the wintertime. Um, we've got a, a video coming out. If our backwoods hillbilly internet will keep up, we've got like, it's, it's like an hour and 12 minutes. It's me and Dan from the Contrary Beekeeper Show kind of recapping all of last year and talking about what we're going to be doing next year. Um so maybe keep an eye out on that. But it was just one seemed like train wreck after the other. Now here we are, December, where most most folks get into the bad habit of getting their bees put away at Thanksgiving here in Ohio. And then just that's it. You know, that we'll start flirting around with the idea of beekeeping again in about March and April. The, the problem with that is the weather has been so bad that those bees are constantly breaking cluster, burning up their, their food stores. There's nothing really out there. Uh, for them to go after and it just it just it what it does is it 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 compounds issues i think that were already there um and so with us it was summer was really lacking going into the fall trying to get everybody mites and pests get them further get them further get them further try to get a break from a fall flow hopefully it was a nice cold winter but that woolly caterpillar we looked and that woolly caterpillar said three weeks of hard winter the rest of mild ending in a couple a uh, couple more weeks that's that's what it's been. And uh, we just recently actually put liquid feed out up here in Ohio, which sounds crazy. But we have pro suite that we put in uh, one gallon buckets and got a bunch of, of colonies fed, at least get it on it. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, when we start dipping down into the 30s again, we'll flip those buckets up so the so we don't have any issues with them. But I mean, it's been you know, Bruce is sending us those photos where it's like 70 degrees. He's out there in his flip flops. He's he's like, hey, guys, which suntan lotion should I use today? Meanwhile, you know, me and Brian are trying to grow our beards out and we're, we're dressing in layers, trying to get it figured out. It's 20 at night, 50 during the day. And, you know, I, it, it was nice seeing those. Bruce, had you ought to put that picture up there, Bruce, where it was the flag and the sunset. Maybe you put it on your your Facebook, sir. But that was, that was gorgeous. Yeah, I will. It's it is on it is on Facebook, and yeah, I don't know how. I mean, I could probably do it, but I, the technology right here is a little bit. I don't know if I could figure it out. While, while it looked here. warm, just the sunset. Look I there, mean, it is. Look at that. Look how warm that looks. Seventy-two, I think, in that picture. Yeah. But uh, yeah. you spoke. You spoke of how Greg. Sometimes it seems that you know you get so many bees, you split so much, and it just kind of the bees will kind of kick your butt a little bit. It's kind of how I interpreted what you were talking about. Almost like it gets too big. Yeah. And I want to give Ian a shout out here from Canadian Beekeepers blog because he did a video back in June, I think of 2020. And I'm actually going to try to put hopefully the link. I'm just going to put a link in here. It's called the 10 day rule. Do any of you, are any of you familiar with that? No. Um, Sounds like see. we should be. Yes. I put the link on here. So I think that's the link to the video. We'll see if you want to click on it and see, but, Ian, I hope I'm not going to butcher this, but I, that really um, hit me strongly when he talked about that. When I did my video about the dead outs I had this summer, I mentioned that link or that video. Ian basically talks about uh, how the bees, basically you're going to end up having as many bees as you're able to take care of. And uh, I think what he said, Ian, tell me if I'm right, is that really if you have a, a task to do, if it's feeding your bees, if it's harvesting honey, whatever it is moving your bees you basically have a 10-day window to do that and if you can't get it all done in 10 days then you're going to get behind you're going to start having problems so basically what he said was if you have if you, you can build up to like just say for example i'm going to use the number 200 hives okay if you're only able to maintain 100 hives then you're going to end up with 100 hives in other words you just can't you, you've got to take care of your bees mm -hmm. And that includes treating for mites. That includes down here in the south, especially treating for beetles. I think that's the biggest, the nastiest thing that I deal with is the beetle loss. Uh, it also includes feeding, just whatever. And I want to kind of give a shout out also to Cayman, 
who has kind of really simplified things. I'm sure for those who are going to the Hive Live conference, he'll, he'll talk about this. And I'm going to try to get him on here for a live one of these days after the conference is over and he can settle down just a little bit. I know he's probably exhausted and working hard right now, but Cayman talks about uh, strong queens. Um, and I consider to be young, strong queens, uh, dead mites, and proper nutrition. Ian talks about a lot of that as well on his stuff, using those same principles. And so that is what I'm going to try to do going into this year. I plan to probably not focus as much on honey and focus more on maybe making splits, growth, and keeping my bees alive. And we'll see how it goes. It's been so warm. I think they're actually a little ahead of schedule. I think they're doing stuff now they normally don't, you don't see until January, you know, February, late January, February, even March sometimes. And so, but with the cold coming in, hopefully it'll kind of slow that down a little bit. Bruce, um, there's a bunch yeah. of folks on here who uh, have experienced, have gone through decades, or they may be multi generational farmers like Ian. I, uh, I don't feel like, I feel like we have done a really good job of failing. Um, and scale, always finds itself no matter your context the scale of which you can operate always finds itself either uh, as a pro or a con um but i wonder for us here i wonder if someone if, if ian or anyone else on here maybe has something to say i'll check out that 10 day rule we have like a are we kind of maybe you guys would admit it i, I will we're we're have a, a bad habit of probably being over ambitious and we we typically um bite off more than we can chew and end up eating it cold um, and so we have a, have, we have a, like a rule of three. So is a human life in jeopardy? No. Okay. Then we go on to the next one. Is an animal life in jeopardy on the farm? No. Then we go on to the next one. Is a plant life in jeopardy? No. And we, we circle back when things are getting, when we're really, really stretched in, we have that, that's our like saving grace. If we can at least stay in that rotation and make sure where we can do those things, then it seems to kind of help us. But I think, uh, that, that 10 day rule sounds without uh, seeing that yet, that sounds to be pretty on point for um, making sure you get to the things that need to get. Cause if you can't get to something that needs gotten to in 10 days, I mean, if, if a pig or a cow starts going down with pneumonia, you don't even have 10 days, but if bees need fed or bees need moved or other things on the farm infrastructure, planning, taking animals in um, for butcher, you name it 10 days. If you can get that done, that's good. What do you guys think about the, the 10 day thing? But what, what do you use as a form of checks and balances while you're growing the bee yard, the business, or just trying to keep videos coming out? Oh, uh, go ahead, Brian. I'm sending an email. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I'll go ahead then. Um, that is my biggest dilemma. You know, I, so a couple things here real quick. This is something that I think is also very important. Um, I had a, another friend that, if you remember Scott Turvey, that if you watch my honey harvesting video, the most recent one I did back in, not the one where I was helping out a friend, but the one back in June or July, um, I had a friend, Scott Turvey, who is a local guy here who's, he's military. I think he actually is retired military, but I think he works as a contract as a pilot. Uh, Fort Rucker is close to here. It's a big helicopter training facility for the military right here, just, just down the road from us. And the Scott is in, he's got some bees and he's interested in growing his operation. So he wanted to learn a little bit about how to get, how to scale up. So he came out here and he went through some bees with me. And then he, um, he helped me harvest. We, I got three teenagers to come out and help me. And those kids were hilarious. And we had a great time. And you know, they run with those 40 pound boxes. They're all athletes. They run with those boxes, jump up and down the trailer. And I'm like lugging them, you know, and they're just like running around, jumping up and down the trailer with 40 pound boxes. And uh, the Scott, he, he a, a couple of months later, he called me and he said, there's a guy over in West Alabama, Southwest Alabama that wants to sell some colonies. He's like, I want to scale up. They're on pallets. He's like, it's going to cost X amount of dollars and uh, would you know what do you think about that or whatever do you think that i could get on the truck for pollination next year he's really wanting to scale up quickly so i called my my friend davis who kind of is more of my mentor now here locally especially with the pollination stuff and he he told me a principle and i i've scott if you're on here i don't know if davis talked to you about this or not but he said you need to earn your bees he said you can buy your equipment but earn your bees 
I think some people now, if you're a big person, you know what you're doing. You've been doing it for years. Someone like Ian or, or you, Greg, or someone that really has been doing it a long time. If you want to go buy 200 beehives and really grow, you know how to handle and manage them. You've got the equipment to do that. But for someone who's just getting started and trying to figure out how to scale yeah. up, you've got to earn that. You've got to learn how to do it. You've got to do it by splitting, you know, splitting mm -hmm. high, two to four to eight to 20 to 100 and growing that way organically. And then you learn, the bees teach you and you learn. And you got to learn how to do it that way. I thought that was really wise advice as far as yeah. like you got to earn your bees. You can't just like you know, go out and buy 200 hives and just be a beekeeper because it right. will hit your butt because you don't know what you're doing kind of a thing. I, I agree with that 100% because like me, you know, and, and I, I have no intentions on expanding, you know, and becoming commercial. I just, I want to stay in my niche as that backyard beekeeper, that hobbyist mm -hmm. that, you know, gets out there. And, and as far as like a 10 day rule for me, I have a Saturday rule. Every Saturday is when I go around and I check on my hives and, you know, then when I go through them and I, I assess the hives, I see what's going on. If I do have to, you know, if I see something where additional work needs done, you know, I just schedule that into my work schedule and everything, but, you know, I, I just want to stay in my kind of lane. And I found like me, you know, 10, I, I will be nowhere near either of the two of you. 10 hives is as far as my backyard beekeeping. 10 hives is my sweet spot. Yeah. And that's, that's, it's perfect for me to manage 10. Um, you know, it doesn't suck up so much of my time that it interferes with anything else that, you know, that we have going on. Um, so I, I can't say that I need to adopt that 10 day rule because I have a Saturday rule. <laughs> <laughs> that covers it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's cool. Um, there's a, a uh, bunch of more folks jumped on here. Uh, Dennis yeah. is on here. Todd, uh, Jose just uh, jumped on. on. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Hey, uh, got this comment here from Tom. I'm going to highlight it here because what he says is technically true. It is. I, I get, I, I, I mix them up. I'm sorry. I do that sometimes. The hive is the box. Your apiary has to be colonies, not hives. I've never lost a hive. Now some have been damaged and replaced. Tom, I hear you, man, but I, I you know, a lot of people interchange. I know that really gets on some people's nerves a little bit. And I try to do better in my videos saying that because I've had people, I mentioned that before, but I think that most people, you know, just you just use interchangeably. Technically, the hive is the equipment. It's the box the bees are in. You know, it's the tree the bees live in is the hive. The colony is the colony of bees. But I just wanted to highlight that and kind of uh, let, you know, make sure that, that we he knows we saw that. We understand. Well, I'm not going to keep all them things straight. I'll tell you that. That's I know I don't. I, I, some people really get hung up on that, and it's okay. I mean, it's fine. Please, 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 yeah. please, I apologize. I apologize. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that sounds great. And that's one thing that I think is beautiful about the bee, beekeeping uh, that is beautiful about beekeeping is that everyone has different goals. I mean, if you just yeah. want to have two colonies or one colony to follow yeah. your garden, you know, if you don't care about honey, I've had people, some people say, I don't want to harvest honey. I just want bees to pollinate my garden. And other people are like, I want, you yep. know, and, and then like you, Brian, you've got 10 and, and Greg, you're trying to grow really big and, and, and everything. And I'm, I'm trying to get bigger. I don't know if I can ever become truly commercial, but I'm trying to get bigger. And so mm -hmm. everybody has their own goals. And that's one reason I think growing your, your bees or earning your bees is important because you don't know when you start exactly what you want. You know, no. when I first started, my goal was I'm going to get 100 colonies. I thought, man, that'll be awesome. And then yeah. I was like, well, I mean, I found out that 100 colonies is hard to manage. We are trying to work full time and do everything and, and everything scales up when you have, you know, you got two colonies, you, you need to put honey boxes on, you buy two boxes, put them on there. You know, but then when you got 10, you got to buy 10 supers and put them on there. And then when you got 100, so it gets really expensive and it can get out yep. of control in a hurry. And the fact is that um bees multiply that's what they do they multiply yeah. and they bring in food and so you got to have a plan for those bees that multiply yeah it can actually be a problem down here if they get too strong with the 
issues with the hive beetles and the honey. They can get honey bound, and um, you've got to kind of keep breaking them down. That's a lesson mm-hmm. I learned the hard way. You got to keep splitting and breaking them down, doing something with those extra bees, because if they get too big and bring in too much honey, and then the the flow stops, you go into a dearth, and the population decreases. We have a huge problem with the hive beetles just rocking mm-hmm. them, and killing them. And yeah, it's tough to stay ahead of them. So, yeah, I like that idea of earning your bees. That's that's a uh... You know, when you yeah. when you're scaling up, I we, we say it too. You know, you can. There are no shortcuts um, to. There there are shortcuts to finding success, but there aren't shortcuts to being successful. So you can certainly take, you know, and you can go and you can go get a fifty or a hundred packages, and you can throw them in boxes, and you can grow as fast as you possibly want. But that doesn't mean you necessarily have the not only the the skills or experience to to do that right to keep them all going through the year. But where things get crazy is then when you start ordering things on pallets or feed comes in totes and infrastructure changes, it's you, you get to a, a weird point to where you almost feel like you've gone so many steps backwards to move forward to where you really, uh, you know, looking back, you know, when we had 10 hives, that magic number that Brian said, when we had 10 hives, I, I'll, I will be the first one to say, I had a different relationship with those bees that I miss. You know, there, there, there's a lot going on. There's a certain intimacy with with less 12 hives or less that you can maintain. I used to, would spend more time, you know, sitting in the bee chair, meditating, mm-hmm. reflecting, thinking, looking in on the bees, enjoying the process. Um, and then at some point, just got absolutely ate up with growth and scale and it becoming a business to where now you're so far on down the road, you forget what it was like when you were, putting training wheels on the bike to learn how to be a beekeeper, let alone now you're just way on down the road. And that's, that's great and everything, but man, you know, I, we probably all look back and remember that first BMX bike that we had with the, with the spokes and the handlebars and you hit that curb, you make that jump and you're like, woo, you know, yeah. you forget yeah. what it was like when all you were on that bike and all you could, could dream of is, man, I'm going to get, I'm going to get these training wheels off. And then you're going down, your buddy's going faster, and you're pedaling harder, trying to keep up with the Jones, and one training wheel falls off, and now you're going, the next thing you know, you're going downhill, and you have no choice. That, that's a, that, that's a, not everyone can get to that point and be, enjoy that kind of a ride. A lot of us do, um, but man, to, it, I, I do miss, you know, what it was like to have, yeah. you know, fewer highs, and if, if um, you know, like I said, scale has a way of humbling you one way or another. You never know. It might back. You, there's you, you could always be back down to 10 hives again someday. And that, that, that'd be okay too. You know? Um, actually I've it's got, I'm going to read this. There is a Nebraska cop with cop watch ask how the Italian hybrid Queens from Lappies from Iowa work out for you, Bruce. They've been great. And I'll talk about that a little bit, but I wanted to address this right here. I'll try to come back to that Nebraska cop watch if I can. I, if there's a lot of stuff flowing through this. Um, it's exciting. We got 110 people on here. Before we got on, I said, look, we're going to stay on about an hour, but we might have to go a little bit longer. <laughs> look at this. We're having a good time here. But it says, can you guys discuss how your marketing slash sales changed as you grew? So I'll just, I'll start off with that. Um, you know, my biggest, I have not sold a lot of nukes or a lot of bees. I am just very nervous about quality of my nukes. I just still do not feel super confident. If I sell a nuke, it's, my nukes are going to be my best ones that I have typically, and most of them have done well as long as the people have, um, as long as the people have uh, taken care of them, they've done pretty well. Usually they're almost too strong, too fast for beginning beekeepers, but I, I just haven't done a lot of that. So my main source of income has been historically the honey sales. And as you all know, honey sales are difficult. Um, you, you know, if you're a hobby beekeeper or if you're kind of smaller, like a sideline like me. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Sorry. That's okay. You can sell quite a, you can sell what you have, but as you grow and you get more, then it's tougher to get rid of it. So what I did, there's a couple things, and I, I, I talk about this in some of my videos. I need to do some more videos on actually how I sell my honey. I did one recently about my self-serve box outside my house. If any of you get a chance to watch that, that was kind of a fun video to put together. But I basically sell, I, I sell, I put my honey all in five-gallon buckets. This year, we ended up with around 100 five-gallon buckets of honey. And then I just store it that way. And I do have a, a bottling tank, a Maxent bottling tank with a heating blanket around it. And so it's very easy to bottle it up. 
um, you know, quickly. And I have some stores that sell it. I sell it primarily in one pound and two pound squeeze bottles. I buy my bottles from Sailor Plastics. And um, I sell it to stores. I sell, I have a couple of places that sell it retail. Go ahead, or sell it retail um, that, that I sell to wholesale to them. But most people I sell at my retail price. Now, I have sold hundreds, if not thousands of bottles that way. If I didn't have those those retail sources, those stores or those um, farmer's market type places, there's no way I'd get rid of all this honey. I still have quite a bit left, but it's they have saved me. So I think if you're going to grow, you need to find some stores, some uh, fruit stands, uh, some people that can sell it off the shelf in their in their place um, because it's difficult to move you know, 500 gallons of honey, just personally, person, you know, word of mouth or whatever. I sell quite a bit that way, but without all, you know, and then the other option is to sell it in bulk in the big, in the big uh, barrels, which I'm nowhere close to that. I wouldn't make any money if I did that. The big commercial people, that's what they have to do. But so mostly my marketing has been, I've made a little money on YouTube. I've made through honey sales, kind of, as I described, I also sell uh, these glass muth or muth bottles. I dip them in wax. This is a video I want to do is show you how I do this. I dip them in wax, the lid, and seal it. And then I have a little label I've stamped that I that I um, punch, put a stamp on it, and they really look classy and nice. And they sell those in some of the nicer uh, stores around here. I also um, for gifts are great for gifts. And so that if you want the honey, I tell people just for the honey, probably just get the plastic bottles. But if you want to give a gift or, or have something really nice, get those bottles. I sell those for significantly more. That's a lot more work. The other way I make money a little bit, just starting to a little bit is the pollination stuff, the stuff out to California. I am so small time in that. I'm still learning that game a little bit. Um, but I would like to grow up to where um, I could send off a couple of hundred hives, maybe in the future, 100 to 200 hives. And then ultimately maybe a mile truck, if I get that big, if I can handle that. Or between me and my friends, we're going to try to put together a truck soon. We aren't going to be able to do it by ourselves this year, but we've kind of got a group together. We're going to send some out. And so... That's my main source of income. That's my main strategy um, right Bruce, now. Bruce, what, what would you, uh, you know, after all these years are grown and, and getting that to there, is there something that you wish you knew then that you knew now? Well, I'm, repeat the question. I'm sorry. I was looking at my phone. <laughs> yeah, after, you know, you've, you've grown for the last few years, so now you're talking about, you know, shipping out, you know, pallets to, uh, for almonds. You've, you've grown your, not only your scale, your context has kind of evolved as you, start to figure out what you enjoy, what you're good at, what makes sense as an enterprise um, for the business. Is there anything that you know now that you feel like, man, if I would have known this maybe even a year ago or two years ago, man, that could have really saved me time, money, uh, or heartache? Well, the biggest, a couple of things real quick, and, and it's just a matter of things you have to learn. But number one, when I lost about 50 hives this year, I realized I needed to do a better job of being on a schedule of treating and feeding and taking care of my bees. That's number one, to avoid loss, which you're going to lose some anyway. And I may lose a bunch this year too. I don't know, but I'm going to try and do better with that. And number two, um, just efficiency in the hives. I, you know, I, I just get so amazed by the bees. And so um, I just want to go through them and take my time. And as a hobby beekeeper, Brian, I, I can tell you really enjoy doing that. And, but as mm -hmm. you, or you can't spend as much time per colony. That's one reason I went up a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the larger beekeepers in the state of Alabama, if not the biggest right now, commercial guy, I just went up, he's about 140 miles north of here, and just sat down, it was raining outside, but we, we went in this facility and we just talked to bees, and, and uh, he just, he talked about, you know, the importance of efficiency, and we talked about that a lot. That's what I, my next step is to learn how to be much more efficient. And so that's what I need to learn still, and I'm, I think I'm getting there but i've got a lot to learn um but i i'm not really sure that if that's the answer to your question but that's that's kind of what i think uh, how about you what, what about you uh greg well <clears throat> I, I, it, it took us a little while i think to figure out you know we were you know when we were at 10 hives and 12 and 20 we caught that bug to where i think there's a certain thing that that resonates with you that really gets you excited to get out there and crack the lids open and for us it was the whole process of of seeing a queen emerge get mated come back and go like game busters learn how to I, we're we're in we're in east central ohio so we're in the foothills of the appalachian mountains so there, there's a certain um thrifty culture that kind of goes along with our heritage here as far as being in the hills canning our own food 
raising our food, raising our meat, things like that. There's a certain thrift um, on the farm, but also there's something, the things that we spend a lot of time doing, canning the foods and things like that. There's a certain, um, I think it's, it's just inside of some of us where if you can take something on the farm and work with nature and you can take one and turn it into three and five and seven, well, that's how our ancestors and our forefathers got us to this point where we're sitting here with technology, talking on YouTube about all the things that we're doing. A lot of folks had to do a lot of things right years and decades before us to get us to this point. So there, for us, it was uh, when we get inside of a hive and we can we can take those resources and manage them and go from one hive to four to 12, you know, it, whether it's taking a package and splitting it three ways, taking a nuke, splitting it four ways. There's a lot of risk there, but there, there's something that's just, I just, I, it's hard for me to explain, but making queens and splits and nukes is just one of those things that just resonates, I guess, maybe is, is the best word for us. How, how the marketing and the sales have kind of changed is, is once we started to get a lot better at doing that um, and folks were interested in, in, in some of our genetics and getting some of the bees that were here, you know, at some point there's more demand than you have for the product. Um, and so we have a whole presentation that we do, hard lessons learned growing a bee yard. Um, and it's really tough when you are, you know, growing a business enterprise where you see the demand and you try to figure out how can I get the product to do that? What we ended up doing and we are still guilty. And I say, we, my wife, I don't know if she's going to be listening back to this, but if, if she is, um, she'll tell you that I have done a very poor job at running enough hives off to the side as resource hives, primarily for her and for honey, her friends can't understand, you know, how can you have hundreds of hives, but you can't sell us a pound of honey. Well, I get, I've, our, I've been stretching our resources in the bee yards too thin to try to raise and grow the yard um, at a certain rate. Um, and it, it works for the most part, but you know, at, at a, for us with our other businesses and raising a, a large family and on the farm right now, until I cut anything else out or I take irons out of the fire, you know, I, I, I will be probably maxing out at about 200 colonies for the next year um, and so I can find more time because what happens for us at 200 colonies, the wheels start to fall off the bus. And when the wheels start to fall off the bus, not only is it a uh, an, an ego check, which we all need, um, is uh, not only is it incredibly humbling, which we all need, um, but when you're talking about financially losing because of the risk you take, well, that's a different story. And I think that's kind of what separates when we went from backyard to sideline scale is when your decisions are really costing you a lot of money then we really have to kind of reevaluate that relationship. Um, so I don't know if that as far as marketing and sales, as we kind of fell into the genetics that we really like here, um, the kind of bees that we have to offer, the kind of queens that we raise, that dialogue uh, changes as we've kind of discovered what that is on the journey. Um, but one of the, the main changes, I think, as far as sales here is, you know, Brian was just down helping us uh, slap together, or, you know, finish the wall out. I'm on this new building. We just we were in the we're right now moving from one smaller farm to a much larger farm with infrastructure and buildings and lots of land. Um, and it's an incredible blessing to be able to do that. So because of that, we're getting into things um, that are profitable on the farm, which is retail sales, boxes, frames, bucket feeders, feed uh, packages, queens, nukes, all of that um, at a scale that we can actually do. So that whole sales aspect kind of changes as you grow and do just enough things right, you know, to see the future, to see the future and keep moving it on. Um, but man, the mistakes along the way, good Lord, Bruce, that, that'd be a three hour conversation. I would love to have um, because I, I've, I think I've made more mistakes than I've done things right. Um, and I'm not really too proud to admit that, but there's been enough folks along the way who have been a lighthouse to us, who have helped show us the ropes um, be there uh, to not only encourage us, but to be there to support us financially um, on the farm, which helps us every single year dig in and try to do better and do better and do better. Um, but I, I'll just, I could blab on all night about mm -hmm. this. And that's the key yeah. is that you do. You know, we had a, <clears throat> and I, I just recently, you know, like I said earlier, I'm a BYU fan and the current coach out there is Coach Satake. He's really doing a good job. And when I was there, I played for Coach Edwards, Lavelle Edwards, who was an icon. And, and I think that, that Coach Edwards, uh, I don't remember him saying this. He probably did when I was there, but I think Coach Satake has adapted the, adopted the motto, B 
be your best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, just be the best you can be. And so I can't do what you're doing. You probably don't want to do what I'm doing. And same with you, Brian. But each of us mm-hmm. needs to figure out how to be the best version of ourselves and whatever it is we're yep. doing, like beekeeping or work or just, you know, if you work like I do in a hospital or just being a human, or just yeah. being a good father, husband and father, you know, or, you know, wife or mother, just whatever, mm-hmm. daughter, son, just be the best you can be at whatever it is you're doing. Yep. So I wanted to address one thing real quick before I go to you, Brian. Uh, Matt, I guess it was Matt, or Matt and Sarah asked if the, the self-serve box I have, if it overheats in the summertime. <clears throat> when I first put it up, I had it facing to the west. And like the first day or two that I did that, it I, the honey was hot. It had to be, it was probably 120 degrees in there. It was really hot. It was like a greenhouse. Uh, if hotter, if not hotter. And so I turned it on the fence. So now the side of the box faces west. And it doesn't even get, it just is like whatever the temperature outside is. It doesn't get too hot. And so, no, it did not. But you can't have the glass, the plexiglass facing the sun, or it will be just extremely warm. And so it was too hot. And if you look in the background, I changed this out. I've got some of my glass. These were some uh, wedding favorites I did for my daughter's wedding back in Mm -hmm. 2019. So that's kind of how I do them. If you can kind of see how the the wax on the lids. And there's a lot of work. It's awesome. That's actually the tags for her wedding. But we have a little different one we use if we're selling them. Hmm. Public, but we can you know get customized tags or whatever and i wish more people would do the wedding favors because they were super popular and they were really really nice but that's kind of what i just wanted to show you guys that so that cork looks clean but it looks like it's sealed just at the bottom of the cork to the glass no if, if you look over to the uh to the one in the bottom right hand corner you can see there is a little layer of wax on there okay I, okay yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really, a, I figured out how to make it a kind of a thin layer of wax and it just, they really look That's nice. I mean, the, the two stores I sell them in, these that I sell these in are both uh, fine steaks and wine, fine wine and steak dining type places. And so mm. they put them right in there where they, they sell the wine and they, they disappear pretty, I mean, not super fast, but they disappear pretty quickly and they sell them for a little bit, you know, they sell them for a pretty hefty price and they do well. So nice. that, that's what, what I wanted to show you guys. Um, so Brian, tell us a little about your marketing, or where you, if you're kind of doing this as a business. You know, I, I tell you what, I I'm like the I'm the grunt. You know, I I go out and I mess with the bees, and my wife, she where she works at, it, most of my honey gets sold to her coworkers. Um. My mom will, you know, she'll have friends that that buy it. And and it's mainly just, you know, it's word of mouth. I really don't, just because I'm I'm the backyard kind of person, I don't have the number of hives where, you know, I really I couldn't supply like even if there was one store that said, Hey Brian, yeah, you know, what we'd love to sell castle hives honey. I don't produce enough. Um, you know, so I really as far as marketing and that. I don't do any other than just that word of mouth. And yeah. we're, if you've got, because people love that local honey. And so yep. you've got people that, you know, like where I work, if I had the number of hives you have, I could probably sell it out to just family and friends or give it, I give yeah. it kind of away as well to people. And so it works out good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But hey, yeah. I want to, I want to throw in, I, I tossed in Greg's link. Um, so that way, you know, I, and, and we actually have several Ohio um, folks watching tonight. Um, if anyone, and, and I'm, I'm throwing a plug out there for Greg, if anyone um, is looking for bees, I, I can 100% vouch for the bees that you get from that guy right down there. I, in the middle of summer, when it's hot, I am out there, you know, and, and I, because I'm that, that hobbyist backyard person who enjoys, you know, looking at the frames and, you know, touching on them and stuff like that. I am w- shorts and t-shirt and I'll have a veil on, you know, and, and it's the genetics that I got in, in his bees. I love it because people will ask, well, well what kind of bees do you sell? They're mutts. They're, they're Appalachian mutts is more or less it. And they just, you know, they've been raised for those certain traits. And they are very just, 
as that hobbyist beekeeper working hives with the temperament that they have, it, it makes it so enjoyable, you know, so I can't vouch enough for the bees that, that that guy down there sells. Well, I appreciate that, Brian. That's, that, that says a lot, you know, that's the main thing. If you got to, especially with, with whether it's your, your first year, your third year or fourth year, you know, everything gets uh, extremely complicated. If the bees have mm -hmm. a little too much attitude, yep. um, especially as you're learning to, you know, not everybody is 100% comfortable with getting into an angry box of bees and can set, get, get to a place mentally where they can go through, do the things, calm themselves down, find that center. Go. Not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And some of the folks that can don't want to do that with bees yeah. that are just ugly. You know, we, that's one thing we, we, yeah. we, 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 nature's image farm that that's our yep. farm. And we try to let everything exist within that circle and that cycle of life. Yep. Um, but one thing that we are absolutely ruthless and brutal um, is if there's a queen um, in a colony that is just looking at us sideways and they have any mm -hmm. kind of attitude, but just don't, there is no zero tolerance. That hive will get yeah. split into a, a million different colonies. We'll drop queen cells in or do, do a lot of grafting on our good queens. Mm -hmm. Make them calm, they're gentle. Because we want folks like Brian uh, or even a first year beekeeper to be able to have smooth, calm genetics mm -hmm. and not have that hurdle. Because there's a lot of us that had, you know, our first, the first boxes of bees that we bought, you know, we were at that time, I mean, we came into this through organic farming, you know, and our mentality was we want Ohio overwintered treatment free bees. And we found two nukes and we brought those nukes here and they were angry. It's absolutely, uh, that's, that's a whole conversation, but those bees were angry and upset for lots of reasons. Um, and it, it kind of sets you back a little bit because now you have to learn how, well, how do I work an angry box of bees and having G genetics or bees that you are comfortable working with whether it's a full suit and, or no gloves i think that makes that yep. makes a big deal then you know bruce down there you know we send our bees to i guess what we should do brian is just send these these uh, uh ohio appalachian mutt bees we'll just throw them on some pallets i'll throw them on the truck we'll drive down we'll just put them in bruce's backyard and when those bees get down to sunny alabama I mean, they're just going to be out there drinking margaritas, just relaxing in the sun. They're they're going to be on vacation. They're going to be smooth and calm. What are we doing over here? I need some of those. That's it. I need some of those. Mine are too mean. I, mine can be crazy. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's one of my goals is to just. I mean, my when I first got into bees, my mentor told me uh, just to. You know, you expect your bees to be defensive because there are animals and there are pests. There are. Um, you know, things that bother the bees and they need to defend yeah. themselves. But, you know, when you just, they can be, it can be too much. I mean, defensive yeah. is one thing, but I do, I have had some super, I've ordered some queens from out West that were just super gentle. Like you could open them up and do anything you wanted to without even putting on um, the gear. And, but they just didn't seem to be really resistant or really, you know, I mean, they looked strong, they blew up and they kind of died out and, and they were a little bit almost too, calm but i i don't know That's, mm -hmm. i really want to i want to have younger better queens i want to have more gentle yep. bees and i want to have you know stronger bees and and yep. that's kind of what i want to do and that's kind of my goal my goal this year is to get some queen cells or you know i got the bees i got from lappy's bee supply up in iowa i got them late in the summer i basically i used them to fix some problems i had some hives that were that was right on the tail end of when my hives were dying out I had some that were weak. One of them was so mean I couldn't even. They were okay until you cracked the top. Once you cracked the top, they were on you until you left the bee yard. And I, I'm not going to do that. And so no. <clears throat> those I, I put a I put one of those lappies queens in there. Found that queen, pinched her, and put one of the lappies queens in there. And they just that's uh, one of the ones I think that I uh, showed you yesterday. Hey, we have a new person entering this chat, and it's going to be a surprise. We've invited him on. We saw he was on here, and we were excited to have him. Here we go. <laughs> good evening, guys. How are you this hey, evening? Ian. How are you this evening? <laughs> Ian. We're doing good. Hey, I, I'm so glad you decided to come on. I just, I, I just want to say one thing that uh, 
when I was younger and we used to go to parties, uh, we used to go to parties in town and such. And, you know, this party would start at five o'clock, whatever, but we couldn't go to the party until we, you know, we worked till 10 and then we showed up at the party and everybody else was flat on the floor by midnight and we took it well on to the evening. So don't let me take this party well on to the evening too long. <laughs> I, I have one question. What is in your glass? Oh, of course, this is uh, vegan eggnog, <laughs> double cracking. <laughs> that drink, that drink is going to go viral. <laughs> it was my select drink. I, I suggest anybody drink it. Oh, so man. what's happening tonight? What are you guys up to? Well, we're good. I think you've been, we've just been chatting and talking about different things. When I first got on here, I told everybody it was going to be about an hour, but here we are. <laughs> it's just been so much fun. I think there's been some really good information here. And we've had it, we've just got a tremendous group of people on the chat watching right now and participating in the comments. And I appreciate everyone who's on here. I apologize if I haven't recognized everyone. It's just been almost impossible. And all you guys who've done lives understand how difficult that is. But we are thrilled when when we started talking about Ian and the 10 10 uh day rule and, and he said that's right. And I said, Well, hey, let's just invite him on. And so I appreciate you coming on, Ian. This is really cool. It's awesome. Yeah. I actually went back and looked at that video mm -hmm. and watched, and holy man, have I ever aged? How, when did I do that video? That wasn't too long ago, was it? I think it was 20. That was before the eggnog. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, right? <laughs> back then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 42. I guess I'm getting older by the year, right? Wow. You're 42 yeah. right now? Yeah, I'm 54, so I've got you guys all, I'm sure, in about several years. <laughs> yeah, you know. I was just listening to you guys in the shop. It's been kind of cold up here, and we're having trouble keeping the equipment going, so we're just doing some mm. maintenance on the equipment for before we start the day again tomorrow. But uh, you guys are pretty easy to listen to, so it's kind of fun. That yeah, is fun. Well, tell us about the 10-day 10, 10 rule straight from the horse's mouth. Tell us what that what that means. Yeah, it's kind of more so just like that metric. You know, beekeepers are always asking um, the question as they grow, you know, how do you manage all this work and how do you manage time and, and all these variables and factors out there. And so, I, you know, I – Pretty much the old man's taught me this is just the 10 day rules. You want to try to fit things in within a 10 day period, whether it be seeding or, you know, in beekeeping, if you're splitting your hives, if you're making your round of honey, you want to be able to work things within 10 days uh, because if weather throws variables at you or other things come at you sideways, like breakdowns and such, you have to be able to then get that work done in good time. So you have to leave yourself a little bit of leeway uh, and keep everything nice and tight and together because if you don't, if you get caught and you start running long, then you're just forever catching up and you can never catch back up. And ultimately what you do is you sacrifice your production or your hives, right? <laughs> it's the old saying, the bees, it's not the beekeeper determines how many hives you can manage. It's the bees. You know, when I was managing 500 hives, I'd build up to 750, but I didn't have the facility to handle that. So I was always behind on my workload. I was always playing catch up and those bees brought me right back down to 500, if not punished me down to 400, right? Until, you know, I put things back together, hired some guys, brought some facility in, then I can manage 700. Then I stretched up to a thousand, you know, it's just that kind of that seesaw back and forth all the way up. So, you know, just trying to form that metric, in regards to how much can you handle, how much can your facility handle. And if you can handle the workload in front of you 10 days out, you're going to be on top of the job next 10 days out. And there you go. So that's basically what I do. That's just a philosophy we run on the farm and it's a pretty solid strategy. Awesome. You guys got any questions for Ian? Well, I, I like, you know, I like that approach. Um, and it seems like you have, you uh, or your dad or grandpa along the way have all learned some things the hard way and each generation you try to pass down some of those and of course you're going to make your own uh but one thing you know and i was may, i might be reading too much into it um but I, I really at least what i thought i saw happen with you i really appreciated it and had a lot of respect for i think it was i can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before yesterday you were doing a trial run on your uh, hive life presentation Oh, and it was okay. a part one and a part two. Well, right at the end of a part one, what I think I heard you say is that your walk just came in. 
did you did you go spend time with family and go on and do some kind of a scheduled <laughs> walk? Yeah, I, I walk That's with my huge. wife every morning. Yeah. yeah, when we're busy, like I get up, I try to get up early enough so we can go for a two and a half mile walk first thing in the morning. And then when I'm not so busy in the winter, although we're busy, but um, how do I manage? Like I'm busy, but I'm, uh, I don't know how to explain this. Like the farm's always busy. Just, I have my, um, my workload. And then after I take care of my workload, I help with other people's, like my brother's workload. So we kind of work together, but we had to focus on our own workload first. And then within outside of our own workload, we manage uh, kind of our personal time kind of deal. You know, working with in thin business is an impossible thing. Working with family is even more impossible. And it's just trying to find that balance of work and life, right? And work will drive your day every time. So you have to be able to focus on that. But when when you don't have to, you got to step aside of that. So yeah, I, we go for a, a two and a half mile walk every day where we try to anyways. And through the winter, it, I, we take a nine thirty walk instead of a five thirty walk. So it's, uh, mm. it's, yeah. And I was going to introduce you to Sandy, but you know, you guys are better with technology. I am. I pressed the wrong button and I kicked you guys all off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I saw a lady come in with a coat on. And I thought, man, if you, that, I just, I thought an awful lot of that, you know, cause it is so, a lot of us get so caught up in, growing the farm or whatever the business is um, that unfortunately um, sometimes our families are the ones that suffer first as we try to grow, we push so hard. And where that really, really kicks you, you know, right in the ribs is when you push so hard and you make those sacrifices or they make those sacrifices and yet you still push so hard and the wheels start to start to fall off the bus and the things that you're pushing so hard for when that happens and you know, you've either neglected or taken time away from the family to do it. That really hurts. Um, and so it was just, you know, the, just that little thing that happened there in passing, I just, I really appreciate it because it's a reminder, you know, to all of us, no matter the scale or the context or what we're doing in life, you got to actually, you know, we, we, we're never going to find the time, but make the time for the things that actually matter. Because, uh, if, if the entire farm or the bees go to hell in a handbasket, the families are the ones that are going to be there, not the bees. So I, I appreciate yeah. what, what you're doing there. Absolutely, Greg. I mean, that brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> it's a it's a constant struggle. I tell you, it's it's impossible. Business is a bitch. You know, like it it doesn't let up. It's always there. Yeah. And uh, you know, a guy like me is a little bit workaholic. I just love it so much. I just keep myself submersed in it, and it just ruins you. You, you gotta, you know, boy. And I've learned the hard way on that. And I've very very forgiving family, but at the same time, has been able to adjust myself. To build to yeah i'm doing this for family i'm doing this for lifestyle uh this is our livelihood this is what we want to do so we have to maintain other things other than the farm and actually it, this youtube project like all this stuff i'm doing on youtube is my attempt to uh, get away from the farm you know still connected to the farm being a farmer and such but still you know it's my way to get away and this is my hobby so you know i, I I just come back from the shop and I'm sitting here talking to you because this is, this is what I want to do to get my mind off the farm. So that's kind of sounds a little odd, but yeah, I'm having a lot of fun doing this. So thanks for inviting me anyways. <laughs> We're so glad to have you. Ian, here's a question yeah. for you from Randy. Can you see that on the screen there? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, cold climate with a very insulated hive. Will the bees eat more or less of their stores when the weather is, 50 when it is usually 20 yes yeah when they're more active typically they will consume more um, the problem more so comes uh, if they start actually brooding like if you have your hive set into winter and they're just kind of coasting and maybe they're flying and they're not really developing whatever but once they start demanding resources when they start brooding then you got to be careful so warm weather does decrease dictate that kind of development especially outside if you can get them flying if they start bringing stuff in they'll start brooding up and that's good as long as it's going to transition into you know favorable weather so they can carry on that development <clears throat> but if that if they ramp up that development then all of a sudden cold winter slaps in like up here just, just to add some reflection to that comment mm -hmm. like up here we start winter in november guys outside 
And then we typically end winter in April and we'll get sometimes a February will come in and the bees will start getting really active and yay, you know, they'll start to brood up, start demanding resources and March will come in like a bitch and just hammer those hives because they have all this established workload and they don't have the resource to cover that. So the beekeepers have to be very careful and how soon they ramp up the development and if they do, they got to make sure they follow suit, making sure they have everything they have on hand to be able to maintain that as it goes on. Like my winter shed right now, well, I, now it's like minus 35 out right now, but it's not hard to keep the shed cool. But earlier on before Christmas is a little bit warm and my hives were a little bit too active. I'm kind of concerned that because they're so active, they'll consume more stores. I kind of want to slow them down so they don't eat as much and just kind of drift themselves through winter. But uh, yeah, warmer is typically not always a good thing. Yeah, that's one thing I was talking about earlier. You know, I've been sending pictures and kind of rubbing in the faces a little bit of uh, Brian and Greg here. My bees are just blowing up. It's been so warm. We were, uh, today I think when I left work, it was 76 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, I have no idea what that is Celsius, but that's, you know, it's spring weather. <clears throat> but we're due up to have some freezing weather for us, you know, low 30s, low to mid 30s Fahrenheit coming up, nearly freezing this next week. And so the bees get really confused and, <clears throat> you know, they'll brood up and then it gets cold. And so it's just kind of like the matter. Of, and, and they they have plenty of weight on the colonies right now. They've been bringing in pollen from somewhere. But it's just it's just like, a you know, it's warm. The bees are active. People think that's good. But I think the bees almost do better when it's a little colder. Uh, on average here in the winter time i yep. think you know, it's just kind of a it's okay we're trying to build these colonies up for for some pollination stuff but mm -hmm. but it's kind of a tricky thing to try to do um, to keep them march you know, in my opinion i still haven't figured it out really yeah that's what i was saying earlier march will be the key you know here just because <laughs> this winter you know i i would rather and and i'll dread i just dread saying this but i would rather have the snow you know and that way we have that cold spell and I know that the bees are clustered up and they're just kind of hanging tight. And then we get into spring, like right now where we have, you know, Christmas day, we were upper forties, almost 50 and rain. It just, you know, so March, March will be, March will be the key. You know, March is going to be the month where I'm really going to be watching just to make sure that what I, did to prepare my hives worked and you know that'll be the key also if i have to call up this one down here and say greg <laughs> help me out again buddy <laughs> well you're such a good hand uh, on the farm here I, I told my wife i said man you know brian can you just jumped right in i didn't have to ask him to do this or do that you saw the work ahead you just jumped right in you read my mind you grabbed the tool you, you were at the front of that barn sighted off in, in no time and you're welcome to come down and I I know turn in I later. know that eventually I'll get a good donut. You know I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> next time I'm gonna make sure I tell you what I don't want to you know this this is gonna get very off the rails but they have uh, an amazing apple fritter now apple fritters across the country they vary okay hopefully uh, hopefully Ian has more than just a Tim Hortons fritter up there but down here when you get them and they're and they're fried just right. And that outside is just crispy and glazy. And as soon as you bite in there, you get a whole mouthful of just this blasting apple. Oh man, it's that's that's so I'll try to I'm gonna next time I had to go get the metal for us. So I was a little late. I'm gonna go get us some donuts the next time. Do, and make do they make that. apple fritters on Tuesdays? What's that? Do they make apple fritters on Tuesdays? As long as I get there before six thirty, because the rest of the town gets them. Well, do, you, do you like fritters? <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I, speaking of I apples, like do, like do, you, I, do you guys are are you any of you guys into phonology? Because I I'm, I'm curious. We're we're talking about uh, Ian's going to be way different. Bruce, that's like complete opposite, and it's it's a little bit concerning. So phonology is the study of plants and flowers, and one of those little when, when you start to see, um, you you take action based on what you see rather than having I'm going to start splitting my bees or the beekeeping season starts. On the calendar date, well, it's for us here. When the maples bloom, we can almost we we know that we can almost we're we're right there. We can get started when the apples bloom. 
We can do no wrong. We can make as many queens as we want. We can go to town splitting, can do no wrong. But mm -hmm. where this gets a little bit tricky, and I, I'm wondering if you guys have a, an indicator at the first of the year. Right now, it it, 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 add, it, it scares the socks right off me. A buddy of mine, I'm not sure if he's on here um, or not, Mark Smith down at the Flatwoods Bee Farm in Locust, North Carolina, he just posted a video that the bees are actually out hitting maple blooms right now. Well, here in Ohio, typically we don't we we tap our maple trees, um, and it's usually right about Valentine's Day, right around February 14th or so is when the maple season is here. Well, for the last three years, it's it's getting pushed back to where now it's mid January and and we're tapping trees because it's it's 40 during the day and 30 at night, and the the sap is just going like gangbusters. And then before you know it, we're in February and, and the maples are budding out three weeks before they had been five years prior. So now it's like when we start to see the, the maples bud and it's the end of January, you start to get a little bit scared because you know you're not ready in the bee yard. But I wonder, do you guys have a an, an indicator um, that you see out in your areas that is kind of like, oh, man, we're getting close to really let's get stuff short up. It's time to go. Well, I've, I've heard just this year down here that the winter solstice is when a lot of people say they start to build back up. You know, we did, we always have some warm days here or there. This year has been extremely warm, but so they start building up some, but of course, when it gets cold, I think it keeps them held back a little bit. So that's kind of, and then the red maple blooms, like, I think it's probably blooming now starting to, mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, I don't know yeah. if I've seen it, but I've heard that it begins around Christmas time. And so um, that's kind of what it is down here. It's, I think we're a little ahead. I, I heard a little thing, a uh, little rule years ago. Someone said that for every hundred miles north to south in the latitude, you're about a week different, weeks difference in beekeeping. Now, obviously, that's a very general rule, but I've heard this kind of like, you know, a hundred miles south of us, they're probably even ahead of us here. And so I've heard that rule. I don't know if it's true, but, you know, you think you guys are probably five or six hundred miles north of here. And so, you know, you're probably going to be a little bit behind us as far as the brooding up and everything, depending on the weather and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that, uh, uh, Greg. Um, my main indicator, uh, which I focus my entire operation around, is in the spring, I let the bees tell me when to start my split work. And that is when I start seeing drones, not just a few, but a lot of drones walking on my combs. Because what the bees are telling me as they've transitioned out of winter, they're in spring, and there must be enough resource or enough uh, plenty or whatever you want to call it, enough am ambition, I guess, maybe, that they're starting to make drones because there's no drones make it through winter up here. So they, they rear the new drones. Once we start seeing those drones on the comb, then we start grafting because we know in 10 days after the graft, those drones will be mature enough to mate with our queens that will just be emerging and then we're off to the races. So we gauge everything around those initial drones. Drones. Hmm. Got it. Okay, cool. That is, yeah, that's Interesting. A good thing. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And we have no drone. Well, you look in the hive, you'll see the odd drone in there or whatever, but you know, I'm not sure about you guys, but we have no drones in these winter colonies. They're all females. So then when, once you start seeing, well, we have some old timers say, ah, oh, we got to, you know, make those early queens because those early drones are the ones that we want to mate with. And I don't know if I subscribe to that or not, because I, what I want to do is mate my queens with abundance of well matured drones. So we're always looking at the combs and just trying to read, we actually read all the activity on the nest according to the drones. Um, once they start emerging, that's when we start grafting. Uh, then, you know, once they, once we, have the queens grafted and the cells are ready. We've got to start making splits. But generally at that time, we're not taking split, splits from the colonies unless they're pulling their nest down. And they pull their nest down, they make drones, right? So drones in that case. And then again, in the fall, late in the fall, we're waiting until the drones actually get kicked out. And once the drones get kicked out, we know everything is pretty much complete. Plug them right up, get them ready for winter. So drones is a pretty big factor on on your really schedule for a workload we let the bees tell us what to do mm. do you see is there do you happen to see like um crab apples full on or something that you've seen year after year that's right about the same time where you see an abundance of drones yeah you generally like we have the trees the, with the the willows the the poplars 
uh, and then those are the early trees that the bees transition on. And then we get into more maybe maples and then we get into apples. Uh, then all the fruit trees like the Saskatoons and choke cherry, all those trees. Yeah. Dandelion seems to be the target. Right about the time dandelion hits, like the pastures come in bloom, boom, just like that, things start to go. So we're looking, those early growth and then that dandelion pretty much triggers what we're doing. So yeah, we're looking at the, the plants also. Hmm. I'm looking forward to that time of year again. It's, it seems like you're oh. never ready, but <laughs> it just seems like you uh, all of a sudden it's like we, we, when we see the, the maple blossoms, it seems like there's enough pollen out there. They are good to go squared away. Yeah. But well, what I love is the spring peepers, the frogs that we hear at nighttime, just when that weather starts to get right, it's just glorious. But we uh, have those here as well. Yeah. We have a rule up here again. Like we have rules that we always follow up, but uh, I don't know if this sounds ridiculous or not, but we have to listen to the frogs sing three times before spring actually comes. So, yep. you know, they'll, they'll pipe up and then cold will come through. They'll pipe up cold. And so we have to hear, hear that third time before we start seeding. And, hmm. you know, I don't know if that we reflected, let bee work at all, but uh, it's just kind of one, one of those things we listen to. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. It sounds kind of silly, but we follow those well, rules all the time. Right. Well, it's kind of like spring is upon you when animals start talking and making noises. And I mean, it's just it's time probably. Yeah. Like, sense yeah cool. yeah ian your your drone um we like i i typically i won't see any if i if i see any activity with my hives here where i'm at we typically won't have any drones and and if you do like you said we we get those oddballs you might have one that you know i think he hit out in the corner so that they didn't see him <laughs> to toss them out but yeah we don't we don't see them either yeah Awesome. Well, guys, this is I'm, this is awesome. I'm so glad you joined us again. I really appreciate that. I wanted to, I think we're going to start to maybe wrap this up a little bit. My goal was an hour. It's looking like it's going to be closer to two, which has been incredible. I, I just, I could go all, I'm kind of like, <laughs> kind of like came in in a way. I think he could go all night and never stop. But Well, I'm know. the late one to the party, so I can go for another hour. That's true. <laughs> what, if, you want to talk, if you want to talk, we'll let you talk, man. I mean, we're no, no. all ears, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be good seeing you all guys in Tennessee. I guess hopefully, hopefully, and you can make it down there. But uh, oh, man. yeah, it, uh, my plans. You know, that's only a week away, and my plans. I'm I'm coming. Like I'm going to be there. But we just had COVID hit the farm. Took a couple of hired guys down now, and I'm like, oh, oh shit. You know, so we're just kind of the Fine. families separated just to kind of isolate ourselves, so it doesn't kind of go through. We're protecting the workload. So there's always going to be somebody healthy or whatever. We're not sure how it's going to hit everybody. Oh. We're all vaccinated and such, but we just want to protect our workload but the guys are you know so hopefully i don't get sick before i come down that would be murphy's I, law right i tell you what though if if ian can make it down then he, i'll just greg i know you well you might not have room because you'll be packed up from i know everything that you're gonna haul i'll i'll throw them in the car and i'll drop them off at nature's image i know you got a building that you're working on you know Oh, and you don't want me to help build a building. <laughs> <laughs> My brother's a carpenter. He he's good at that. You know, I'm good with a sledgehammer and monkey wrench. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that that'd be the road trip. <laughs> that would be a heck of a haul, wouldn't it? Oh, it's man. probably harder to get back into Canada than it actually is to get to the states. Yeah, it is uh, to get down there. I just need to do a quick test. Hey, you guys are very welcoming. Yeah, come down there. And then I have 72 hours to get back without a health test. But then, you know, my, my times, I think I'm 68 hours when I fly back. But if I, if I have some kind of a delay, I know there's airlines being delayed down in the States right now. So if I do get delayed, I need a, like a health a PCR test. And that can take as much as two days to get the results back. So I'm going to probably get that done on the Friday when I'm down there. So I can have it just in case I get delayed. And yeah. Just so I can get back into Canada and just hope I don't get sick. Cause if I get sick, then you guys will have to deal with me for 10 days. <laughs> well, I, I will say you, you're uh, a lot of us um, would probably put much less effort out uh, to travel and, and to do all that with that many complications. A lot of us would just be like, okay, well, sorry, but I, I, I applaud you for, for working so hard and sticking with it to see if you can, 
and get down there. Hopefully yeah. we'll see it, and then maybe not this year. Maybe it'll be next year. Yeah, I came in. I'm, I'm trying not to talk to him too much right now because earlier on in the year, he's like, ah, oh, you know, our government's just kind of like this all the time with restrictions and shit. I said, you yeah. know. And now with COVID hitting the farm, I'm just trying not to talk to him a little bit just to relieve his nerves. But I'm going to try mm-hmm. to make it down because there's 800 people showing up to the con- con- it, There's something very special about this conference. It's not like the other conventions I've spoke to where it's associated effort bring it together and, and they're just bringing speakers in to fill the stage, right? Like this is something very unique. My, my email box is full every morning of people telling me they're going to be there because they want to shake my hand, they want to meet me. I was like, "Wow, this is this is really neat." I think what Cayman's got going here is, like, I'm I'm the chair of the Manitoba Beekeepers Association, so I'm very involved with putting our conventions in, and I do put those place takers up on top to bring the content to everybody who shows up. Uh, so I I know how much work it takes to put one of these things on, but we're very issue oriented, and you know, something's going on with the industry. We bring industry speakers and. Is very business orientated, but Cayman's got something where he's bringing a bunch of people together to talk about beekeeping. And that's what everybody wants to hear about is beekeeping, right? And sometimes I think when we put on these conferences and conventions, we forget about that. We have all this issue and business and all this kind of stuff ahead of us, in front of us, but we forget about talk about beekeeping. And that's what beekeepers want to hear. And that's what Cayman's putting on here is he's bringing a bunch of beekeepers together to talk about the bare bones basics of beekeeping and mm-hmm. and uh, I'm, qu- I'm quite excited to come down there well actually I, that's i'm a little bit torn because what did you say there's 850 people going to show up <laughs> yeah plus vendors yeah <laughs> well so there's going to be you'll be standing up on that stage with oh. then 849 people just looking right at you i know and but there will be Those lasers lights, and fog. The lights better be bright light. so I can't see anybody, just, right? I mean, it'll right. be a thing. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be, they're gonna be great. Gonna yeah. Be awesome. I'll look forward to it. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I look forward to meeting you guys, too. Like, this is, uh, I've really, like, I touch base with pretty much all of you guys. Well, you guys have, you know, just kind <laughs> of introducing ourselves to each other in the last little while. But uh, in a way, we know each other, but we've never actually met. And I've always found, like, I talk to people online. And it's superficial. You don't really know the person because you're just reading text. And I find when I go to the conferences, you meet the person and it just adds that layer of familiarity. And then the conversations after are just that much more important. So I like meeting people. It's just, you know, I'm going to meet so many people. I won't be able to remember anybody's name, but I, I want to meet you guys, have a beer with you. And, you know, it's, it's going to be something special. I, I want to try... The eggnog <laughs> by itself? No, 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 no. I want now. Tell me how that would be the the round table chat, and everybody can have this eggnog. That, oh boy, that I don't know how to make it. My wife makes it. Uh, it's a vegan type type of drink, and I'm you know I'm a cattle farmer. I don't eat vegan or drink vegan stuff yeah. my, as a rule. But uh, it's I mean. This stuff is fantastic. So I don't know <laughs> how to get the recipe down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get the, bring that recipe down. Cause I, I mean, if, if you, every, you, you literally are, you're in that every day. Well, it is, it is, tis the season, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sandy lets me away with a few drinks every mm-hmm. evening. So I take advantage yeah. of that every time. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's no, I, I tell you, like you said, this, this conference I, you know, I was kind of teeter tottering. And then last year, you know, last December, um, you know, I, I was sick. So I would have wanted, wanted to go, but I was sick for three, almost four weeks with it. So I just, you know, in January I was, I was recovering. I mean, I, I could hardly even shovel the driveway. Um, this year, just when I saw that those, you know, he was having the conference, and the tickets went on sale. I was like that first day. I'm like writing the check, and I'm like, "Came and I'm coming," you know. But yeah, like you said, it is. I mean, it's. I think just everybody that's going to be there, you know. And from you know, from me, I think I'm you know of the four of us on here, I'm that that hobbyist, that backyard beekeeper guy, you know. To be able to sit and listen to, you know, mm-hmm. folks like you, you know, these these top end 
you know, commercial beekeepers just talk and share, it's going to be an amazing time, you know. And then the vendor list also that he put together, it's just the deals are are amazing. So it's going to be a great time. It is. Yeah, just watch Cayman's video before, uh, you know, a couple of hours ago, he uploaded one yeah. talking about 800 people coming through the gate. And it's something I didn't really appreciate. He's got to get 850 people through this gate in a, a couple hours. It takes a lot of manpower. So he's got to have a staff behind him to do that. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's impressive on his own. Yeah. Hey, Bruce, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question. I watched that video of yours uh, where you're putting your honey out on your uh, fence by the looks of it, you have this nice display and yeah. it's all an honor system. That's quite unique. Uh, yeah. Do you feel that um, uh, that everybody treats that res with respect and, you know, pays you <clears throat> accordingly or do you feel you get ripped off or sometimes or how, what's your reflection on that? Well, it has been amazing. Of course, that was a concern. Um, I have a friend, a younger guy who's kind of a hobbyist out in the country, not far from here, who does did a similar thing. His is a little different setup, but I kind of got the idea from him. And he has a great, that's how he sells all his honey. He gives, I think he gives some to his family and then just sells whatever he has that way. And so I thought about it for a little while and I wanted to do something over here. My wife and I thought it was a good idea. And I just, the idea that came to my head, just turn a bee box sideways and make a little box out of it and set it out there. So I went over to Lowe's, talked to the guy about how to, you know, how to, he cut me some plexiglass and we got the thing put together. Um, and that was a concern, honestly, the honesty of people in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I live in a little suburb right here, a little uh, community out, just part of Dothan, which is where I live here. And we put that thing out and, we have probably 98% of the people either pay as much as the price is or a little bit extra. We have had a few that have it, it maybe a couple of dollars short here or there. We did have two, uh, two two pound bottles disappear, but we wonder that same day we sold a couple of five gallon buckets to somebody at the post office. And one of the workers there asked about it and, and we told her, you know, just go by. There's an honor box. Go by and get some. We, we wonder if it was the same day. We wonder if she thought that we wanted to give her some and didn't realize she needed to pay. But those are the only two bottles that we that have disappeared out of. We've sold, I think, over eighteen hundred dollars worth of honey there. And we've had two bottles. Wow. Of them. We're not even sure if that was dishonesty or not. I got the I sell my two pound bottles for fifteen dollars. And um, <clears throat> we had I have one earlier this week where they paid eleven. But that might have been somebody who paid 20, you know, before. So they might have just been kind of evening it out. I'm okay with that. We anticipate a little bit of loss. But honestly, I would say basically it's, it's insignificant if any loss. We probably made, we probably come out to the good, actually, because people do pay. If they got 10 bucks and it's an $8 one pound bottle of honey, they'll put eight, 10 bucks in there instead of eight sometimes. Or they'll put a $20 bill if they don't have five, you know, 15. So um, I, we've been thrilled with it. And it's been a really good source of, you know, how to get rid of some honey. You know, almost mm -hmm. $2,000 worth just since June. We put it out there in June. That's good. So that's, that's yeah, that's really good. That, that just reinforces my faith in people. I mean, I think I the, the majority of people are good people. It's just you have one or two that just screw it all up, and then everybody focuses on that one or two problems that happens, yeah. and everybody thinks everything's a problem. So I, I really like to hear that. Yeah. I, I, um up here, we have a, an auction, um, a farm auction business, and uh, and they do sell uh, beekeeping uh, stuff too, like a, a retirement sales and such. And uh, I went up to this one auction sale, and I got my ticket number and everything, and, and asked if they needed in my credit card information. I said, oh, no, no, we're not too worried about you beekeepers, because for all the years, we've been doing this for 40-some years or whatever, we've never had a beekeeper rip us off. So, you know... <laughs> You know, there's, it's, wow. uh, it's, I think we just focus on the negative a lot of the times and when uh, there's so much positive out there. And I've just seen that display you had up on the, on your uh, fence. And I know you're in a little more heavier populated place than I am and honor system with a little box here full of money. I just, the first thing I thought of was, was of someone ripping that off, but I'm, I'm very happy to hear that it's working out for you. Yeah, I, and it depends on the area. You know, I've heard stories of people that 
had an honor system that worked for years and then people started stealing their hand they had to shut it down and so oh, yeah. i've also heard stories of people that just say you know there's no way it would work here and so i've had i've got friends locally that tell me that you know they're they might be located near a, a neighborhood where they don't feel they can yeah. trust people but yeah I, probably, me once, I guess too right i think yeah i think i've got a hundred maybe 150 bucks in that thing maybe a hundred so it's not bad and so i figured well if it doesn't work out, we can just take the plexiglass off and put it back on a beehive and not yes. worry about it. So I didn't think it was too much of a loss. And, you know, you sell 10 two pound bottles of honey that pay more than pays for it. So what the heck, why not give it a try? And it's been, we've been very pleasantly surprised. It could change, but so far in six months, about 1800 bucks. That's not, that's awesome. Yeah. It's not too bad. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if, if Brian, if you've got, Anything you'd like to share as far as products that you might have available? I know you do a couple of things that are a little bit unique. Uh, one thing I like is that 3D printer, that little hive that you make. Could you Do you have that handy? Could you show everybody what you do there? Let me see here. You have it available? There you go. Let me share it. Hold on. I'm figuring all this technology out. Oh, there we go. Do you have that? Do you have access to that where you can just pick it up and show it to us, or is it not right there close? You know, it's sitting. I could move my camera. Let me see here. Let me see here. Don't, don't worry about it. But if you just oh here, it. hang on. It is actually right over there. So that's the three D printer. It's it's pretty. I tell you what. Um, let me get this thing. Let me let me. Do you, do you have the little hive? little hive that you can show us you know what yeah i do actually right there how, how big is that isn't that cool guys that is that really is cool neat. it is wow. like here's my hand um so it's i forget the dimensions on it let me let me uh stop sharing my camera while i'm messing with this i forget the dimensions on it um it's on the uh on my site um i think i have the dimensions of it in the description um it is from the floor to the top of it it's five and a half inches front okay. to back it's four and, and a half inches i think that's really cool guys and, and you've got more a basic model you also have one that has frames in it right you can actually get the frames you know i have been so <laughs> busy it, it's crazy that that you know um <laughs> you you have me bring that up i've been so busy printing those feeders that I have not had time to even print a sample of the frames. So, and I, just before this, I sold more of those feeders. Now, luckily I had a little bit of a down spell the other day and just thinking about, Hey, you know, trying to be prepared. I printed off a hundred of them the other day. Um, you know, that way I would just be prepared for sales like this. Um, but yeah, when I get that thing printed up, that little hive, and I, I in fact, I told Greg that I was going to bring one down to his place when I print it up. That way, when he gets his shop, I could say, that little thing over there, I had something to do with that. And I remember when there wasn't a wall over there. There wasn't a wall here. <laughs> yeah, I can say all that. But that little design has the frames that go in it. There's a queen excluder that can go in it. Um, there's an entrance reducer in that little thing. It's so slick, but but I can't even take credit for the design. It was someone else that designed it in the description on on the Etsy. You know, I I have it linked for that person. That way they get their you know their credit for it. But yeah, that little printer that's just been a hobby of mine. And th those feeders, um, I saw those uh, a couple people used them, and I looked them up. And I got into a little design program and, you know, I did a couple trials of them just to see how they'd work out. Um, but I mean, they, they've, they've worked out pretty good and they've been selling um, pretty darn steady. So I think I've sold, I think I'm closing in on probably 400 of those things that I've sold already. Wow. So it's, cool. yeah. I want, to, I want to give a shout out Walker Beer Ranch. Thank you so much for that. It has been really good content because of these guys that are right here with on the chat with me. Hey, Greg, do you have anything you'd like to share with us? Any type of products that you really like or anything that you're selling that you might be interested in sharing with the group real quick? 
Well, sure. There were, uh, the, we'll be down at the Hive Life Conference um, uh, selling just uh, the main focus for the Hive Life Conference uh, is to just what we were, Ian, we kind of alluded to is, you know, this is awesome to have these um, remote conversations and see, you know, to put the face to the name. Um, I think a lot of us are also kind of old school and really appreciate when you can be face to face with somebody, a cup of coffee at a table. You can read the body language. You can pick up on the innuendo. You, 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 it can have a conversation um, at the Hive Life Conference. A, a part of our booth, the, the, the Nature's Image Farm booth, is also the podcast, which is the Contrary Beekeeper Show. I think Dan is on here. Uh, he's my fellow co-host on there. Um, but we're going to have the cameras and the mics, everything set up. Um, and it, it doesn't matter if this is your first year and you have no bees or you're, you've been doing it for 50 years and have 5,000. Everyone's got a story to tell. Um, and that's what we're kind of excited about is for folks to come into the booth and just share a little bit about them and beekeeping with us. And we'll put that on our YouTube channel and podcast. The other aspect um, of that is we sell buckets and our bucket feeders and the plugs that go in them. We've done that for years now. Um, and that's kind of how the, as we went from the small farm to the big farm this year with the buildings and all that, we're setting up some retail. Oh, there's those, um, those Mason jar nipples. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, you know, all of these and not, not to, you know, get off a of Greg, um, oh, no, all good. of these, I, I saw a couple other designs, but they did not have this little piece right here. And I made these so that when you insert them, you have that washer that you can put on from the other side so that, you know, you're from the inside. And then you also have just that little bit more of, you know, um, you have a little bit of that area on the front there as well, just to get that real strong grip onto that lid. But yeah, these things have worked out. So. Yeah. Feeding is one of those things. There's a, a, everyone's got their own little way to do it. And that's, that's, it might be a neat thing to be able to stick it in there and get it between the frame. Uh, there at the Hive Life Conference, we're going to have stuff for sale. We're going to have a lot of stuff for sale here locally um, in Zanesville. One of the things that have been a game changer for us is just a, you know, it's, everyone's seen a bucket feeder before. They're they're handy. They're, they have a, they have a, their pros. They have their cons. Um, we, we have these, these different type of a plug that goes in the inside um, where we can adjust the flow and the rate by drilling uh, a certain amount of holes in these, depending on if it's a one frame split uh, or if it's double or triple deeps. And then you that's how we kind of adjust um, how much flow, how much rate. And those are just really handy. That's this, as we've grown our bee yard, the feed and the, the, the feed and nutrition has, has been huge. Um, but being able to put feed on, on a colony um, and have an on off switch, like for us right now, you know, it's, it's uh, 50 degrees during the day. It's 30 at night, so during the day we can put we can put feed on them, and these have a beautiful on-off switch to where when it gets cold we can just flip them upside down and, and they're good to go. That that's helped us in our context at our scale keep feed on the bees, um, especially with something heavy right now, the three to ones, which is pro sweet. It's has been pretty handy for us. But well, that's look at that is fancy. I don't even know how you're doing that. You're bringing up the there's our website. Look at that. You guys are good. I tried to do it when it's flashing, but that Brian going there and did that. So Ian, don't use, Ian, you use some bucket feeders, don't you? Yeah, we primarily use bucket feeders. Yeah, we use a, but we have a stainless steel uh, screen mesh on our pails, though. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, Ian, do you have any particular words of wisdom or any type of products that you recommend or that you really <laughs> like to use that you would recommend to people? Uh, no, just uh, uh, we'll say that if I can't make it down to the Hive Life, I, I think Jose just offered he'll take my spot on stage. So I, <laughs> <laughs> you're making dance for it. Yeah, I'll just sing pass for my take it on to him, and then he can stand and talk in front of 850 people. So, you know, but uh, no, I, I'm uh, actually I got to step out of here right now. So I got to uh, I got to mosey on here. But uh, thanks for inviting me to your little live chat here it kind of ended my day off quite nicely. So uh, we, we absolutely hard. appreciate it. Well, I appreciate all you guys. And I, I did have real quick. I just want to show a couple of things that are my favorites and, and Greg will recognize this. This is a, I got this box from Ooh. Premier. Yeah. And I will tell you when they say it smells good, they are not kidding. This stuff is wonderful. And so That's I haven't tried stuff. it yet, but I'm going to try some. I'm excited about it. Premier foundation and then i like of course i you guys know i like the laura b's vaporizer so 
Uh, anyway, I think that's probably about it. I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, it's been basically two hours. I really appreciate you coming on, all three of you guys. It's been a lot of fun. I think we've had some really good information shared tonight. I really appreciate everyone who has checked in on the chat and participated. There's no way I expected to have 100 and I think, what, 16 people on here at, at one point in time and or more. It's been great. And I appreciate all the people who moderated. And I think we'll go ahead and close it out. Just I, I'd like to reiterate, I was reiterate one thing I mentioned earlier is that each, everybody out there in your beekeeping journey or in life in general, just try to be the best version of yourself. If you'll do that, I think you're going to turn out okay. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and end it now. I appreciate you guys. And we'll go ahead and end this, this, this sub broadcast. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Lots of Got fun, guys. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.